the Uncle Dale, you could rub his power stash for three weeks of good luck. Three weeks, people. Fabster, good to have you here. Boom to you, Bama, John Swan, Eva. Eva. All right, moving on. And uh, there's gorgeous Jenny right there. Travis DeLuca, Dirt Road, nice to have you all here. And uh, Davey, nice to have you back. And uh, Brett Lewis is here, which means we can officially start the show. Vanner Smith, nice to have you here. Hi, YJ, how you doing, buddy? Uh, we got 20 seconds here, so old Davey better pick it up. Nikki in Seattle, nice to have you here. And uh, the Michael Leger is here, everyone. The Michael Leger. Tommy Ireland, what's happening? The Jim Christie has arrived. Stu Pot, Goya based, how you doing? And uh, I think the rest of you are going to have to wait. Magnus, uh, we'll throw you in too. And uh, we're good. We are good. We got it all. Geraldine Roscoe coming up right now. Super Chat is open. Get your horns up because here we go. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. All you got to do is go to YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. I'm telling you, I am so excited to have Geraldine back. It's been a couple of months since we were blessed with her presence. Geraldine Orozco is the owner of Bay Area Meditation in San Francisco, California. She is a pranic healer who literally takes time out of her life to help counsel and guide those who have had everything from health issues, internal issues, spirituality issues, consciousness issues, and ET contact and abduction. I'll tell you, she wears a million hats. She is always moving at about, oh, I'm going to say 142 miles per hour. But you know what? She always makes time for us. And that's why we love her here. And that's why we bring her on each and every month to break down the spiritual you. Geraldine, thank you so much for coming back on Spaced Out Radio. How you been? Dave, I'm so good. Thank you so much. Once again, it's such a wonderful thing to be able to see all you guys again, Dave. I missed you. Thank you. I, uh, and all the listeners, hey, how are you out there in the chat? So good to see you guys. I have a very important question to ask you right off the bat because you're always yeah. on the move. You're always going. Where do you find time to do laundry? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there it's strategic. <laughs> It has to fit into the week. There's certain things. It's the eating, the resting. I really, really, really try to walk the talk and trying to keep balance, Dave. Really. I even make time to go for a walk, make time to meditate. I have to get those things in. Without that, there's no Geraldine. So, <laughs> No, and I, and I can understand that because literally you, you are averaging maybe four to six hours sleep a night. Your schedule is never ending. You may start at six in the morning and you sometimes don't end until 2 a.m. I mean, do you feel you're pushing yourself a little too hard at times? You know, Dave, it's so, it's so funny. That's such a great question. But you know, the thing is that none of what I do feels like work to me. Uh, at this point, I, I really love truly everything I do. And whatever I can't reach or I can't do, I, you know, quietly help myself just reaccommodate my schedule and focus on what's important. I do have a lot of things coming. But you know, what's interesting, Dave, is that right now, when you have clarity of what you're supposed to be doing in life and why you do it, um, I think that, you know, it's kind of the fuel that keeps you going and it doesn't really allow you to crash or to have those kinds of things. Now, 
the kind of internal work that we're doing, because all of us are evolving, even myself in my meditations, I'm doing so much healing work as well this past year. It's been so heavy energetically with family issues, you know, all kinds of things have come up. So it's not that it's 100% perfect superwoman does everything. It's always a balance keeping, you know, health, family, relationships, work. It's just a juggling. So, but I enjoy everything I do. So I think that kind of helps us you know, get more done. But with your passion and your desire to help people, because that's what you're doing, is you're helping educate, you're helping heal people on a daily basis. Where do you find time for you? Because inevitably, our bodies break down. I have felt it. I keep a very busy schedule, as you know, and I have felt it with me at times. My audience even noticed last week in our YouTube <gasps> chat where I was like looking like I, I was dead tired and then I needed about oh. 46 hours worth of sleep. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, but we do break yeah. down. We're human. So yeah. how do you, how do you control yourself from that breakdown? No, I don't think it's a matter of controlling. I think that once I've reached the limit and I need to check out, I have to check out. It's it's very simple, uh, you know, and, and I... I, I go by the, the motto that, you know, when, for example, you know, I had technical issues last week and I couldn't continue doing some live videos this past week. So, you know, you kind of have to readjust and as much as you want to continue doing things and you're like, oh, you know, why isn't this working the way it's supposed to be working? Um, you just have to readjust and keep going with the flow. I always believe that everything happens, you know, divine timing. So when I'm pulled away from one project, it means that things need to marinate and then I need to come back to it. Um, and I find that I'm most efficient in that way, uh, personally. But I mean, I, I'm dealing with this with my clients so much. I mean, sometimes the body, like when we reach a certain level, you do crash. If you don't listen to that call to take that break, the thing with me is that I always listen to the call. Whenever the call comes that I need to step away from things, I do it mercilessly, um, you know, because the health is first. The health is first. And so there is always time for meditation, always time. And because I try to be present in what I do, I try to maintain that awareness in all the things that I'm doing. So sometimes the crashing isn't coming as, um, you know, often as it would if I was completely unconscious when I'm doing those things. So I really tried to keep a balance. This last year, my health has really kicked me in the bum. Um, so I have really had to make some adjustments energetically and also with my diet to really adjust to that too. So I think all of us are feeling some kind of challenges and, and really making us reconsider how we're doing things. But I, yeah. I don't like to talk COVID or anything like that mm -hmm. on the show because it just opens up an entire gamut of argument and, and everything. But I do want to ask you, with people becoming more restless in society because of lockdowns, because of regulations, because of the the media, the political pressure, the everything. We're not the same as we were a year and a half ago coming on two years ago. How do we break out of that shell to try and bring ourselves back to some normalcy when every day we are bombarded by this government and regulatory crap that's out there? You know, the answer to that, in my opinion, is that there is no normalcy that we're going to be going back to. And I, I hope not also. I think the reason why we went through what we went through in the past year and a half, the two years, is precisely in order for this system to begin to break down. And we need that. Because if we didn't have something like this to shake things up to the level that it did globally, the entire world stopped, right? If we didn't have something like that that caused that, I think we would have kept going in this monotony, in this hypnosis, where we keep doing things. And although we have those questions in the back end, think about how many things came to surface in the past two, three years that we had known, but it wasn't being confirmed officially. Everything from UFO ET contact to the health uh, industry, pharmaceutical industry, so many, so many different things have surfaced up as a result of this big change that we're dealing with. So in my opinion, we actually want to exercise the ability to keep moving in change, in constant change, never settling and getting 
comfy in any one position because um, this is the beginning of a very long stretch here. We're, we're not coming towards any kind of end. This is the beginning of major changes globally in which we're going to need to be very strong, very brave, very courageous. And always remember that everything that happens externally is a reflection of the chaos happening internally. So we have to take more time to meditate and get our mind very, very strong, very clear about what we're doing here as humans. It's more than just getting involved and lost in the distractions of the chaos that's being uh, presented to you. A lot of that might be deception. And I think we're going to kind of begin to see some of these things are coming more with more clarity. We'll see what's true, what's been manipulated, what's been, you know, a lot of things like that are going to start coming out. And it's going to kind of make us look like, hmm, you know, I kind of had this intuition and I should have listened that to that intuition. So right now, the silence and connecting to that intuition is imperative to how we navigate the next couple of years. So, you know, I, 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 I know some people want to go back to that comfort zone, that comfort zone. But I think that if anything, as humans evolving collectively, we have to be really grateful right now for the opportunity to push ourselves into something better, not just individually, but collectively in our families and society, everything where it's being questioned right now. How do we find happiness down a path that we don't know where it's taking us? Yeah, that's such an important question, Dave. And and that really helps us kind of question, you know, what is happiness finally? Because, um, in, perhaps in the old world, what was happiness was to have that little baseline that we can always come back to, right? That feeling of comfort where, in fact, we may have taken advantage of certain things like our health, for example, or feeling safe in our environments. Very key things that we may have taken advantage of or not noticed or been aware of before are now being heightened. And so what that's doing is making us question, okay, well, if I don't feel safe, how can I create an environment of safety for myself? And as creator beings, we have to remember that we manifest and everything begins and ends with us internally. If we're in a constant state of survival mode of fear, we're going to constantly be calling in those experiences into our, uh, into our life into and and the thing is that right now we are really playing a huge role in what we're c collectively creating um even timelines that we're choosing right now because right now we're at a very decisive point in the universe in this global reset kind of situation that we're in right now where where our attention and energy is focused is going to inform what we next experience collectively and it's at such a profound level Okay, that if we are, if our mind is in war, if our mind is in further chaos, illness, and death, this is kind of what we keep bringing in to the cycles. So we really need to take responsibility for the thoughts that are coming out of our mind and the words that we're speaking and take note that it plays an important role. And from that perspective, then we shift into something more creative, more productive, which is to be um, loving and compassionate towards yourself. So much that we're not going to be putting ourselves in a state of fear and anxiety. See, the, the physical body, it doesn't know the difference between illusion, imagination, and reality. It just reacts to what we tell it to do. And this is how the placebo effect in, works in healing. So if, if to take notice of that, okay, so the body is such an incredible intelligent machine instrument that when we direct it and let it know that it's safe it adjusts itself to being safe and the body begins to work properly but if we tell it that it's unsafe then we go into stress we're having the cortisol we're having all these stress hormones and chemicals in the body that create inflammation and illness so we're going through this cycle of of destruction in the physical body so all of these little details are important for us to check in almost daily at this point because they kind of help us remember what's important. These basic things are very important, but they are the building blocks to creating a, a daily experience that is filled with joy. You are choosing joy. You are choosing to appreciate this little plant right here. You're choosing to appreciate the stars in the sky. Gratitude is the key right now. You're grateful for 
you know, having clothes on your body, being having a roof over your head, having food, having someone to love, having a cat or a pet, whatever it is that's in your life, you are feeling grateful, grateful for yourself, your wisdom and the tools that you have and everything that you're researching to learn, to understand, to wake up. All of those things are precious things that assist us right now. And that's where the joy is. That's where we begin to expand that love that is creative. Is it all about love? Yeah. So love is more than just a romantic emotion, right? So sometimes we think of love as, oh, it's just this little hugging, kissing and, and all this, uh, you know, little love that we have. But in fact, love is actually a creative life force. It is the life force. We are that manifestation of that creative life force. The human body is the feminine and masculine that unites. And in that unity creates life. It creates action, creates imagination, creation, art, all these things that we're capable of creating. We are that love. That love is, is, is encrypted, encoded into every cell of our body. So really, when we talk about love, we have to think of either life or death. The opposite, the lack of love, is the road to destruction and basically death. It's where we deconstruct. Love is the road to creation. So it's just those two things that we need to remember. Which one do we want to be in alignment with? And of course, the lack of love is the road to suffering. So we want to try to not suffer. Okay, so if we're not trying to suffer and we're trying to heal ourselves in a very difficult time where it's very difficult to even find a chosen path, I mean, most people, I think, have been able to adjust. Rather than going to a gym, they're working out at home or, or they're using nature in order to work out. You know, whether it's, you know, those holidays where instead of going to Mexico or Florida or California or to Europe, you, you're going camping in at a nice lake and enjoying life in a different way on how to re, uh, to relax and recover. So have we done a good job at adjusting so far in your opinion? I think that how we have done a beautiful job, we have to give credit to humans, to, to each other, to ourselves. For I, I am honestly amazed every single day at my colleagues, at my students, at my um, clients that are working. They understand the importance of going within. This is a time for going within. People know that. And so the time that people are making to go within instead of escaping outwardly, either in distractions, either in your own fear, in heavy emotions like anger, distress, helplessness, or even in materialism, if we pull ourselves back, because people are choosing all kinds of escape mechanisms at this moment in order to kind of move away from that. But there is a difference when you're doing something from a place of really just fear, trying to feel okay, and a place from exploring and doing things with compassion and love. And so when you do things from this other place that's more creative, everything that you do is in alignment with your well-being. We literally fall out of the law of, of accident. This is the law of the universe. Again, it's the same thing. You're either embodying love or you are lacking love. And so either those roads have two different ends. Um, so I think that we are really doing a great job. People are adjusting and they're learning. And we have to remember that the challenges that are coming up right now for us, they are meant to to waken, waken us up, waken up, waken up ourselves in a very profound way. Okay, there are key things. But if we can remember to get through these heavy, heavy challenges that are occurring right now, because it's not just the, you know, the pandemic and everything that's happening, people are being challenged in their families, people are being challenged um, in their careers, in the choices they are, we're dealing with a lot of separation with, um, you know, the medical choices that we're making or not making. So we're coming into a moment where a lot of separation is showing itself up. And so as that separation begins to manifest in different aspects of our lives, um, the key in this moment is to remember to see things not as separate, but as unity. And this will be the shining light that will help guide people through all of this chaos and confusion. Um, so I really want to commend all of you for doing such an amazing job to this point and and listening to your intuition, I'm amazed by the amount of people that are speaking out their truth 
connecting truly with what they believe is right and, you know, walking in that direction. Geraldine Orozco is here for The Spiritual You, BayAreaMeditation.com, GeraldineRosco.com. We have four and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. People are flexible. We are able to usually handle almost any type of situation if we take the time to think it through. You know, the one thing I think we, we've seen over the last year and a half is a lot of panic, a lot of strife. But for the most part, do you see people starting to use their brains a little bit more to calm themselves down and breathe through the positions we've been put in? I do. I do think so. Um, I think that um, because of the amount of chaos and distress that we've been experiencing, you know, we've kind of been looking for ways to cope in a, in a way with this tremendous amount of stress and um confusion because there's so much overwhelm of information that people are trying to find you know what information should i listen to what shouldn't i listen to and this is occurring everything from medical choices to the food you're eating to spiritual guidance that people are receiving and even even in the ufo community people are trying to discern you know what's what and if if a person would dedicate the time to activate their intuition, to exercise the intuitive connection between the mind and body, those that have been exercising that more likely would not be in a state of distress at this time. They will be able to utilize that intuition and flow with every opportunity that comes up and choose wisely in that way. Um, and the, the, the incredible thing about having these tools like intuition is that we don't need to, uh, let's say, pollute it with emotions. Emotions are temporary tools that help un us understand information, information that occur as a result of events that occur outside of us. And when we sit in those emotions and they become who we are, we are not learning anything, we're not evolving, we're stuck, and again, we're going down the road of destruction because the body begins to become very stressed and overwhelmed because of that uh, stagnation of information. So we want to make sure that we're always moving through information. Um, and, and that's kind of the key right now that, that we need to focus on. Yeah, and, and that is the big-time story there, is, is focus. And I think people are doing a better job of that, but, you know, in the end... Our minds are, are about wanderlust. We want to go out there. We want to see different things. We want to travel. We don't want to be busy bodies at home tending the garden or mowing the lawn every four to seven days. We want to be able to see things, feel things, touch things, touch people, hug people. And, you know, I just, you know, look, look forward to the day when we can actually do that all again. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I love my house, but I'm sick of my house. Sick of it. I understand. But, you know, we we will find ways and we will find ways to do that. We're going to find new ways to travel, not necessarily in the ways that we used to travel before as well. But again, we are going through a moment of readjustment. And I think what's important now is for everyone to speak their truth much, much like you are and act on that as much as possible. Because if we, you know, stay in this uh, kind of docile, not really um, just kind of saying yes to everything that's coming up, um, you know, that's that's a problem. So, so we do need to speak up in a sense and kind of communicate what we need. But again, that has to come not from anger or feelings of helplessness because we're never helpless. There is no such thing as this uh, illusion of control. We have to remember that that is mind control first. And then second, we give that power by believing that we are under some kind of suppression and then acting on that suppression. So we need to remember that our power lies in clarity in understanding that what is controlling of the mind is, is on our choice. It depends on us. Um, and then make choices that pull us away from that. In this reset that we're dealing with, a lot of things are going to start falling apart. Systems of, um, you know, food production are going to be limited. All, all these things are going to be happening. So we need to learn how to become uh, more self 
sustaining. We have to be able to be somehow moving away from the dependency, this toxic dependency that we have on a system that is not pro-life, pro-evolution, pro-expansion, and, and is against this uh, ability right. to move freely, you know? Geraldine, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Geraldine Orozco's The Spiritual You continues right after this on Spaced Out Radio. You were on the ball tonight. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Hi, guys. Hi in the chat room. I'm saying many hellos. Hello, everyone. So good to see you guys. Yeah, they missed you. They kind of like you. Mm. Missed you guys, too. Kind of like me, huh? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, they kind of like you. Uh, Kara says, Geraldine, you are a breath of fresh air. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. Thank you for your light, for now, being here. Now, Kara and her twin sister, Krista, have mm-hmm. an amazing uh, uh, intuitive healing uh, uh, channel as well on YouTube. Wow. Yeah, called the Twins Healing because they're twins. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I have to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so uh, you have to check it out. And it'd probably be good for whatever podcast or interview that you're doing for your channel, too. Very cool. Yeah, definitely reach out, Kara, if you're if you want to reach out, and I'll connect with you. Yeah, just watch out. Love She's that. from Saskatchewan. It's like flat Earth over there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're a little wacky in Saskatchewan. That's why the rest of us Canada we separate from them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. It, it's just the way <laughs> it is. Uh, and and here's my man Pascal. Hey Pascal. Uh, now you've heard so that. good to see you. This is the man that I have bragged to you about who opened me up. Yes. Wow. Very cool. What an honor to meet you, Pascal. Have you been here? I think he's been here a couple of times before, of course. He's really only started uh, getting into the chat room the last month and a half or mm-hmm. so. And, Very cool. And so, yeah, my hero, my guru, my friend, Pascal. Love him. Love him. Amazing. Love him. Hey, Super Quest. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, so... I'm Heard so much about you, Pascal. Mm-hmm. Very nice to connect. Yes. Now, there is a gentleman that uh, um, I'm going to try. If, if everything goes good for UFO Con 2022, I'm going to mm-hmm. tr- try and get him da- to come down here there to meet you. Oh, I would love that. That would be so great. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I hope so, too. You will be blown away by his energy and power. It, wow, beautiful. Yeah. And there's Lone Wanderer. Geraldine's voice is so calming. Hey, Lone Wanderer. Great to see you. Mm-hmm. From the bunker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's my man, Pascal. All right. Who else do we have here? There's the gorgeous Kira. The lovely and talented Jessica McCreary has arrived. Hey, Jessica. And hold on. Uh, Nikki says, you just had another male voice, not your voice nor Geraldine's voice. What the heck? Really? We have friends, visitors. Always. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stacy wants everybody to know that she is a Gemini. Me, nice. t- me too. I am a Gemini too. And so let's... much fun. Geminis are so much fun. Uncle Dale's mustache says that blue is amazing, Geraldine. Oh, nice. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Favorite color. Mine too. Mine too. Let's see what else we got here. And there's some. (laughs) 
Dave Scott's voice is disturbing at times. I cringe, unlike the Chad Smith, who is a smooth, cool dude. Absolutely. We all have Chad's, a little bit of Chad Smith inside of us. Hey, Snakes, how you doing? And um, well, let's go here. Um, I just heard your neck crack. That was good. I, I know. <laughs> Did you hear that surround sound nut cracking? Evan Chully, nice to have you here. Uh, hopefully I can get a good crack in. Oh, there's one. Mm. I'm always cracking my neck. Nice. I know. Got to remember to sit up straight. I know. Alex gotta Hunter. Got to remember our posture, Dave. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Snake says hi, David Geraldine. Hey, hey. Snakes. Snakes on a UFO. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we got 20 seconds. A big thank you and merci beaucoup to Pascal, Simon in Australia, and Smithy. Really appreciate the super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. A big thank you to all the veterans out there who are listening in. We love you. You always have a safe home here in our chat room. And here we go with the second half hour. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with the spiritual you, Geraldine Orozco, from San Francisco, California's Bay Area Meditation, is with us as she joins us once a month to talk about everything from our Zen Chi to alien contact and what we could do to ride out the wave that we call life. And Geraldine's website, GeraldineRosco.com. That's the one we want you to go to. So that's what we're going to say. And Geraldine, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, I'm going to start off with Uncle Dale's question here. Normally, I don't take questions until the second hour, but I wanted to talk about this anyways. You do yoga, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I, I'm, I'm, I've so far in life been an anti-yogite. Really? Yeah. Have you have you tried it though? Have you tried? The, I tried uh, it for about fourteen seconds once. I called BS <laughs> on it, and I was done. I was fourteen done. seconds doesn't count. No, you, no. you have to suffer through a one hour class, oh, a heated God. one hour vinyasa, and then we can talk. <laughs> All right. So tell me the importance of yoga when it comes mm -hmm. to healing the body. Oh, okay. So beautiful. So yoga, you know, I was also not into into yoga pre previously. I actually, let's see, how many years am I doing yoga now? Well, now it's probably about eight, eight or nine years that I'm doing yoga. And um, uh, it was actually my mother that got me into it. She was doing yoga. She's, she's doing yoga since I was, since she was pregnant with me. So um, big fan of it, always kept her very fit. But what called my attention to it was that when I, when I went to the classes, um, because you're focused on your body and because you're you're focused on making these shapes and these positions um at first i thought okay great way to keep myself in shape but what i started to realize that it was really more like a meditation in that i became very aware of every one of my muscles i became aware of how tension and stress was being stored within those muscles and as i began to move and stretch and do these movements i would release emotion and there was one point in my life where i went through a really emotional uh, difficult relationship and i was torn to pieces and i i went to the yoga studio and when i started to do i told my instructor about it and she told me do these steps and i thought okay you know whatever new steps they were heart opening steps so i started to do these heart opening exercises and would you believe that i started just crying bawling in the middle of the class um, because it had triggered pressure points within the body, literally information, uh, emotional information was being released through that 
practice. And at the end of this practice, I felt like a completely different person. I was no longer holding this anger, this stress. So I realized that there's actually much more to yoga. And after my contact experience in 2013, when I became uh, psychic as a result of that, I began to understand why that was happening. Because when I would go to my classes and I would see people do exercise, when they would do certain positions, literally I would see heavy shadows removed from their body. Literally, like... like um, almost like this kind of like gas energy, like this energy moving from the body, it would just elevate from the body. And so there is a release that's occurring. And the release that's happening, every single one of the positions are designed to release certain parts of the body, and they work with the endocrine system. So you're, you know, a lot of the ones that work around the neck, for example, you know, you're doing a headstand, uh, a neck stand, you know, with your arms back, you're releasing information from the neck. And it moves the body in a unique way that no other exercise will move the body. So it was incredibly restorative. It was incredibly healing. I was in shape. And when I stopped doing exercise, mostly this year because of, um, you know, the pandemic couldn't go back to my studio. Um, but I realized that, wow, you know, it would store what would help me overcome any kind of emotional stress or anything in the past couple of years was movement was releasing that. So if you're not the kind of person that wants to sit down and meditate, this is the perfect technique for you because you will focus and you will connect with your body. And as you move, mindfully begin to moving and releasing any kind of emotional tension in the body. So it's, it's pretty powerful. No kidding. No kidding. So, you know, for me, I've, and I, I know I'm going to, you know, get some people angry here when I say this, but I have always thought of yoga as being more of a feminine thing to do. Like to me, when I look at it, there's maybe, maybe it's the hockey player in me, you know, that's somewhere underneath my, uh, my uh, chubby body now. But I mean, it always seemed a little bit more effeminate rather than something masculine. But then I'm starting to see all of these football players, hockey players, everybody's jumping into the yoga scene and yeah. it's thrown me for a loop. Well, you know, Dave, actually, in fact, remember the origins of yoga is way in, in the East and in the East, women were not even allowed to be yogis before it was, it was only men, only men were allowed to train in, in these kinds of arts, remember. And even in the arts like Tai Chi and Qigong, these energy movement exercises, all of those were only utilized by men before. Women weren't even allowed into those groups before. So all of these ideas that, you know, men are not doing it. Remember that this became a fad in the United States, maybe, I don't know, the early 2000s, would you say? Right after the big yogurt, frozen yogurt uh, craze, it was the yoga craze that kind of started coming out. So these are little fads that kind of came out. But this is an introduction, you know, that was put into society, really. And so we have to remember the roots of that is actually in the male. So women are actually very new to the scene, believe it or not. They just did a good job marketing it. It was a good marketing scheme, and, and yeah. it worked. But, <laughs> you know, I, I got to say, though, um, here here's my big thing for me. And I, I was talking to one of our listeners, Ozzy Ange, because Ange and her husband in Australia actually are fit, own a fitness center. So nice. I've, she's been, uh, just today, she started sending me uh, things that I can do to try and trim down and not be such shark bait. So... <laughs> You know, that way maybe one day I can enjoy the ocean again without being worried about whether or not I'm going to end up in uh, a shark's belly. And mm -hmm. But long story short, you know, one of the things that I've actually been looking at and feeling is, is as I get older is my body tightening up mm -hmm. and and it and it's getting very stiff in the morning and and very uh, uncomfortable to be in my body, which I've never really experienced before. And I'm sure there's other people. And, and yeah. you know, even spiritually speaking, because, you know, I, I like to have a little woo in my body every now and again. It, it's, it's becoming tougher for me to even try and concentrate on my own spirituality. So this is why I'm kind of leaning towards maybe old Davey should, should uh, get his redneckness out of his, uh, 
Yeah, and his ego would shove it to the side and get get to this yogi thing. You are going to love it so much, Dave, really, honestly. And you know what's so interesting about what you just said? And I want to point this out to anyone else that's feeling that way, too, because I know a lot of us are. And this year, we haven't been able to move, leave our houses as much. So I know we've done a lot of damage to our bodies, not being more active and going out and doing stuff. Um, but remember that the, the key that you said there is that spiritually very much connected to the physical body so everything that we are storing emotionally remember that it stays it stays in the body it's it's recorded in the me muscle memory of the body so we can be storing traumas from childhood in your elbow you can be storing trauma in your chest in your back and all of this over time as it keeps getting triggered and triggered and triggered by events that are happening keep creating stress in those areas and storing more and more the more we ignore it the more we suppress it the more we don't want to deal with it it stays in the body and causes everything from arthritis to muscle problems to any kind of illness and imbalance in the body begins in the emotions. And that's my belief. And, and this is scientifically proven at this point that because of epigenetics, you know, all of these things play a role in our code that we're writing in, in our genetic code. So if we keep stagnant information and not moving and changing our daily habits to be to move the energy of the body, we just become ill, stagnant, stuck. So it has a lot to do with energy. So please try it. Let me know. I can even send you some exercises as well. You might also want to try Qigong, by the way. You might really, really yes. like that. One yeah. of our listeners, Rooted in Gorgeous Sacredness, said that I should try oh. that, that uh, key. Qigong. Qigong. Mm -hmm. Qigong. Is that nice. what it's called? Qigong. Oh, it's, just, it's just so, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I got to do something. I, I know I have to do something. And you know the mm -hmm. sad part about it is I'm fighting you even though I know you're right. <laughs> and I'm fighting it uh, all all of the all of the um Yeah, I'm just fighting it. Plain and <laughs> plain okay. plain and simple. You do know, you have a mat? You need to get a mat. Why do I need a mat? Yeah, you have a mat. You need to that way you just Put that out wherever you are, outside, inside, and then you have a nice clean space to move around without any problem. Just get yourself a nice mat. Get yourself a spaced out radio. You know what? I think I'm going to get you that. I'm going to get you a spaced out radio yoga mat. That would be perfect that would work. for you. Just out of curiosity, if I do this, do I have to eat breakfast foods for dinner too? <laughs> and do, no. I, do I have to all of a sudden sell my truck and, and drive a Prius? Absolutely not. You keep that truck. You keep those bears in your backyard. You keep all the fun stuff that you have right now. You're good. Oh, I should tell you a fun, funny story from the weekend. I told our mm -hmm. listeners this uh, last night. So on our house is like the house of congregation for all the kids in the neighborhood. So it was after dinner on Saturday night. My, my son is sitting on the patio waiting or on the porch waiting for his buddies uh, to to come on down and, and start playing. And so he's sitting there playing with his toys and and all this, and he kind of looks towards the road because he hears something, and he sees this deer running down our street uh, towards uh, the bushes by the neighbor's yard. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really so cool. So beautiful. Yeah, until the black bear was chasing at the deer behind him. <laughs> oh, my God. You guys saw that? Well, wow. he, he did. So he, he comes running inside because we... We've uh, explained to him a number of times bears are dangerous and, you know, if you see a bear, you come inside. And, you know, during this time of year from, you know, mid-August right through till November, you don't lock your doors just in case you have to get inside. Oh, my gosh. Right? Wow. wow. And, and so anyways, long, long story short, he, we got, he's like, Daddy, there's a bear. There's a bear. So we went uh, walking into the, into the forest looking for the bear because why not, right? Why, mm -hmm. why not? I found the bear 35 <laughs> feet up in a tree. Oh, my God. What brought him up there? Well, uh, I wonder what our happened. voices, our voices. He's, he's, a young, oh. he's a young one. And now I got another moth in here. Uh, this is the exact same looking moth that I killed last night. It's his brother. You know, moths are interesting. You know, they represent awakening and spirit, spiritual awakening, the occult and the mystical when, when we see moths. That's fine, but I'll take the daddy long legs <laughs> crawling on my, on my uh, counter right now over this damn moth that's going to be annoying hmm. to me in the studio here. So 
Uh, anyways, long story. You should story. introduce them. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. Yeah, this moth, when it comes in my face, it's going to die. It, it's There it is. Did you just see it on like, the screen? I saw it right on the yeah, screen. And uh, <laughs> there it's dead. There it's dead. I got it. I got it right there. So anyways, uh, long story short, speaking of yoga and the spirituality, explain the spiritual aspect of yeah. of yoga, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. So uh, many parts of it. So let's begin. Let's start with the physical body. First of all, the positions that are created are designed uh, specifically in working with the endocrine system in a way so that when you move an arm in a certain position that's probably uncomfortable normally, you're literally adjusting the body to help secrete any kind of uh, acids or toxins that are inside of the joints, okay, inside of the joints or any of the parts of the body that are having a difficult time moving. And so first of all, um, we have to remember that in those parts of the body that we don't usually pay attention to, and this is why yoga is so powerful and athletes are using it, there's really no other exercise that focuses on those parts of the body and on these kinds of exercises. But when you begin to move that part of the body, for example, I'll give you an example, the shoulders, um, a lot of people have stiffness in their shoulders, some people have pain, sometimes you can't even lift your arm up. And I've experienced that even myself. When you begin to understand the kind of information that's stagnant here, I will see my clients and it'll be like a dark red spot. The dark red spot represents the, the information that's there and the kind of emotion that is stuck in that body. So, for example, um, it, it has to do with a couple things. It could be uh, not feeling loved, not feeling not feeling worthy, not feeling appreciated or uh, taken advantage of by family and friends, either financially or emotionally. So whenever I see this pattern in somebody's relationships, they have this manifestation of the problem in the shoulder and it's them not seeing themselves in some way. So if when in yoga, there's a set of exercises that you can do to help you do that certain kind of positions. When you do that, they begin to remove. And what happens in yoga is that you start to have emotional memories come back to you. Sometimes you will have flashbacks of what happened to you when, when you took that stuff into your body. And when you're releasing it, you will have emotional release sometimes. So it's really, really powerful um, in storing, let's say, traumas that you don't necessarily want to relive, but you really want to work through them identify what part of your body is most stiff and start working with that information. Every single part of the body has, is, is like a pocket of specific information. Okay. And the information ranges vibrational frequency from the highest level of intuition and mental and all of the non-physical aspects down to the most physical primal parts of the body in, for example, sexual organs, and then down to the legs and the feet. Um, the map of the hand of the hand, for example, holds all of the points of the body. All of the points of the body can be found on the hand, just like they can be found on the sole of the feet. So that's how we use acupuncture, acupressure, um, reflexology. All of these techniques are utilizing the same guide map of the meridian energy runways that run through the body. And all of them are in alignment with understanding how emotion is stored. So when you're doing yoga, you're accessing that and working with those areas, releasing any tension that is there. So it's a, it's a profound spiritual exercise to help you Really, if you're not a person that is very visual, let's say in meditation, this is a great way for you to understand the mind-body connection very much in the emotional and physical part of you. So it's, it's an amazing. And remember the ancient mystics, they talked about three ways of the enlightenment, the road to enlightenment. One is the mind, one is the body, and one is the spirit. And the body is what they developed as yoga you know, you become a yogini, right? This yogini that begins to work, a yogi. Um, and so this is what we want to become. This is what we need to. It's part of our ascension process. Okay, so as we are trying to tap into what we do with our own body, does it take our mind on a journey? Does it take it away? Does it cleanse the, the brain from, from working or overworking too hard? 
Yeah, so what happens, just like in meditation, you are growing gray matter in your brain, literally. You are growing gray matter because the mindfulness, the act of mindfulness, the act of sitting in stillness, in silence, uh, but in a state of awareness, combined with a state of awareness, actually allows you to grow gray matter. And this occurs when you're doing yoga as well, because you are moving through the body, you're releasing all of these toxins and heavy emotions that are trapped in the body, and it brings so so much stillness for you. It's almost as if you go and you take an emotional shower. Okay, emotional shower, physical, you're releasing all that heaviness. And by the time you leave your yoga mat, you're very calm, very mindful, very connected with your body. And this is a great way to train your intuition as well, because you have that silence. This is a great way to help quiet the reptilian brain, the reptilian brain that's the analytical mind that's always racing and moving with stimuli. You quiet that down by allowing all of that excess energy that some of us have. Some of us are have a ADHD. Um, I myself had that as a child, and I still have that now. Um, but as a result of that, you know, we learn to bring our attention to the movement, mindfully moving the body. And that really helps calm the nervous system down, especially right now when we're so heavily stimulated with all of this information, fear, survival uh, moments, you know, our, our energetic and nervous system are you know, out the window. So it's another great reason to start yoga. Well, we got three and a half minutes to go here before we have to go to break here at the top of the hour. Geraldine Orozco is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We're talking yoga and the way it can help. Can yoga help connect to your spirit guides and, and other entities as well? I absolutely have experienced that myself, and I know that a lot of my clients do as well. Um, I think that when we go into meditate into uh, yoga, uh, the connection between mind body, I've, I've experienced personally a connection with past life aspects of myself. When I begin to look at any trauma, physical trauma that is stored within the body, even if I have um, some kind of um, uh, for example, scars on the body or something like that. When you focus on those things in the body and you're doing yoga, you can get a lot of information about that, that connect to past lives. And I've, a lot of my um, yoga teachers, we've discussed this before, how incredible you have the ability of tapping into the information that is within that genetic holographic DNA of yours that is being expressed within the physical body. So all of that information is available. I've had people in, in my yoga classes see their grandmother come in. I've had, you know, ancestors, all kinds of things occur when you are in this moment of stillness. And I think that's the magic of this healing. You're healing more than just yourself. You're healing your entire lineage with these kinds of mindfulness practices. Really? And how does this help connect to your spirit guides and, and maybe other entities out there that are trying to connect? What, where does that connection come from? Is it soul-filled once you kind of remove the dirt and scrape scraps from your soul from yoga? I, I'm confused here. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Remember that we're multidimensional. So we're very much physical, but we are more greatly non-physical. There are 13 dimensional planes that we are made out of. And those dimensional planes are constantly interacting with those dimensions. And so anytime that we begin to tap into information that's stored within the body, it's a key that will lead you into other information, other fragments of yourself that are existing in these dimensional planes. So we begin to access that information. So for example, a past life with trauma, let's say you were killed with a sword in the side of your body. And in this life, you have a strange soreness that you don't know where you got it from, but it's always there. So you're in yoga and you're moving and you begin to kind of heal that space little by little, but you start getting memories of these experiences in, in another life. So this is a way to be doing just like in meditation, contractual agreements, you begin to break them and work with that information. You can do the same in yoga. And the idea is that you're, re in, you're reintegrating fragments of yourself through the information that becomes available through the body. The more that you deprogram matrix programming, the more you understand who you are. And who you are is everything and nothing at the same time. You are all the possible uh, things out there. Uh, past lives, future lives, ET aspects of yourself, grandmothers, you know, everything. We are one. 
in such a way that all of that is available to us through the body. Well, I, Geraldine, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. An amazing chat so far on The Spiritual You, which we do once a month with the lovely and talented Geraldine Orozco from BayAreaMeditation.com. Her website, real simple, GeraldineRosco.com. If you want to check it on out, and you know, she is one of the most beautiful people that we have in this entire field. She really is. And we're going to continue on with our Zen and our Chi and maybe some aliens coming up in our number two of Space Out Radio. Talk to you right after the break. All right, we're clear. We got six minutes if you want to step away or get right. a drink or whatever. I'll grab some tea. I'll be right back. All right, not a problem. Hi, Ivy Smith. How you doing? How much head could Fabster lose if he did yoga? Hey, Super Lou! Hey, uh, everybody in our chat room, let's uh, let's give a little bit of a congratulatory round of applause for Lou Jimenez and his crew from Unidentified Celebrity Review for the absolutely stunning big phone home to this past weekend. Great job, Lou! I don't know how you did it, man, but you and your team pulled off a, a, a an excellent event. You really did, and um, you need to be congratulated for that. And uh, thank you so much for tuning us in and, and allowing us at Spaced Out Radio, both myself and Lynn Wallington, to be a part of the event. We really do appreciate it. And uh, fantastic job. Fantastic, fantastic job. Seriously. Um, well, there is a bracelet touching metal. It's on my microphone. I even wore a sports jacket for Lou. I almost put a tie on. I almost put a tie on. Where do you guys want to go next hour with Geraldine? Oh, look at that, Fabster. Fap would only gain weight in his head. It would be inflated by all the compliments the girls give him and his head soaking it all up. Look at that, Fapster. Look at that. Maybe yoga's not for you and your size 72 melon already. Oh, man. Yeah, Lou and his crew better better damn well get some sleep before the big phone home three. Seriously. You guys hammered that, man. Hammered it. And I'm going to tell you, Lou, UFO Dad is amazing. UFO Dad was uh, awesome, making me laugh. Uh, the reason why I'm ch chasing bugs in my studio is because I need a new screen, and I'm too lazy to get one. That's why. I need a new screen. Alien Critter, how you doing? Tacos attract bugs? Damn it, Alien Critter. I had... Tacos for dinner tonight. Two of them.
Yeah, I, I recommend all of our listeners to go subscribe to Unidentified Celebrity Review. Uh, those are good people over there. Very good people. Hardworking, honest uh, crew led by Lou, Michael, and Rather Be Squidding. I don't know what a Rather Be Squidding is, but I'll tell you, he is the king of the pressed shirt. I don't think that he has, you know, I'll, I'll guarantee it, that he has about four or five go-to irons sitting in his cupboard, and he just debates which iron he's going to use for which shirt. Thanks, Chad, for putting that up. Uh, I, I'm on, uh, my vape tonight is pineapple. I got watermelon here, but watermelon isn't as good as the pineapple. Lou, be honest. Type in our chat room. How many how many irons and ironing boards does uh, Rather have? Geraldine, if you're listening, we got about forty five seconds. All right, a big thank you to to Simon times two, Pascal and Smitty for the great great super chats. Hey, uh, Grand Smith or Grandmaster Smith, and uh, hello, Mitchell, how you doing? And he has 14 irons, I thought so. Big thank you to all the veterans out there listening in to us on a nightly basis. We really do appreciate you. You always have a, a safe place here at Spaced Out Radio. High 509er, and to all our regulars, here we go with hour number two. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Piadudic. Piadudic is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Geraldine Orozco, the spiritual you. We do it once a month, where Geraldine comes in to teach us all about our Zen, our Chi, and our ET contact from our alien brethren and sisterhood. Her website is GeraldineRosco.com. Geraldine, always a pleasure to have you here. Welcome back. Hey, thank you. Not a problem. And I want to start off with a question from Alien Girl on Twitter. And she is hey, asking, alien girl. how's your consciousness doing? Got any woo or ET contact of late? Yes, um, I I have. I was actually in Los Angeles um, finishing up filming something, and something very very strange. There were uh, first of all there was a sighting, and after the sighting, um, in the evening time, I had this incredible experience where um, uh, this not not only this light but this feeling of sleep paralysis began. And uh, I began to go deep into a state where I was in between conscious in the room and conscious in this experience. And as this light began to kind of get brighter, it felt like it was pulling me into the light. 
and uh, there were these these beings, these, uh, I think it was like three, two or three beings, two tall ones and one small that was kind of indistinct. You couldn't quite tell what kind of being it was. But the two tall ones were gray, um, and they were wearing these strange gray robes covering their entire body, which is not very likely for these kinds of grays, usually, that I, I have encountered in the past. Um, but, yeah, it was very interesting. As a result of that experience, um, I do believe that it was participation in the hybridization program, and it lasted for about three months. Um, and when I would go out for walks, I would have sightings again, very clear, very clear sightings. And I actually took a video of one of them that I put up on my Facebook, which was very, very clear just with my phone. I was able to capture it and see, you can see that it's moving, zigzagging. And then after a while, it kind of disappears. But before that, there were two other ones that did the same thing and shot directly up, up into, um, into the sky. Um, but yeah, so so some interesting contact recently. Mm -hmm. When you get contact like that, do you what message are you trying to get from these craft or these beings? I try to be as observant as possible to understand first of all what may have triggered the contact. I am, I am, I, I don't know if you know, but I am actually quite skeptical of myself of all these things. I, I'm very much into researching and trying to understand what, what it's about, you know, the psyche, the psychology behind it, what brings us into these experiences. So for me, I really like to understand what triggers, what prompts this experience. You know, did I, um, as much as I'm speaking on these topics, my everyday life is primary working with clients in healing. Okay, so I'm not always in this kind of uh, mindset where I'm thinking that I'm going to have contact. It's all about my clients. So for me to experience something like that out of the blue is kind of unique. And I can tell very clearly when things begin to shift in that direction. I begin to have pressure in the body. Things begin to feel odd, different, different. There is a heightened awareness throughout the day. And... um for me, it's an observation to look at the patterns. At what time of the month is it happening? Is it happening consecutively? I have a, a, a calendar where I mark and I keep track of when I have sightings, when I have, you know, these things happen to me. I've noticed that it really helps me. It helps me kind of have a, an understanding. And I've seen patterns in my life. There are certain times of the month that, they, that the activity tends to go up and other times where it goes down. Really? Yeah. That, yeah, that, that's I'm, very interesting. Yeah, I'm actually in the process of um, putting out this app um, that I designed that will help contactees understand what kind of contact they're having. And it's based on this calendar system where you can track your events day by day. And when it comes up, you track it by answering these key questions and it'll tell you exactly what kind of contact you're having. So that's going to be out at the end of this month. I'm very excited to share that with all you guys. So keep a lookout on Hybrid Mother for that app. I want to get to this comment that YJ made in our chat room. And I never even thought of this before. He says, same with Grays. I was having wake, uh, them wake me up at night. And then it stopped when I got a vasectomy. Have you heard of this happening before? Mm. You know... I have heard of people that get a vasectomy in order to end contact because they think it's going to end it, but it, did, it didn't end it for them. So if you stopped having it when you did, it could be the end of a contractual agreement that you had with that experience. That is possible. Women as well, contactees that literally have gone through operations to remove their entire uterus in order to stop these kinds of contact experiences tend to experience the genetic information being removed in other ways. So here, here's my thoughts on this. I think that we have some agreements with the ETs that we're encountering. And let's say we modify the body in order to no longer supply a certain amount of information from a certain part of the body. The genetic information that is needed in order to create hybrids or any other kind of 
replication program, it doesn't need necessarily your biological information, like an egg or a sperm. They can use other parts of the body and just as much get the base code for creation necessary in order to do that. So I think that there's many different ways that these agendas work. For you specifically, YJ, it could be that as soon as you ended that, you ended your contract with that kind of experience. And I believe that's very much a possibility. I think each of our experiences is different. And you know what I'd love to know, YJ, is if this contact occurs in your family, if you've seen it in your, in, does it go down your lineage, maternal or paternal lineage? It might be that it goes down more the paternal lineage, actually. And, and just take a look at that and see if the family has also had experience. Okay, but considering what a vasectomy does, which is obviously, you know, uh, stop a man from being able to to have uh, sperm that actually work. Yeah. When we look at that, if, if somebody is being used in a hybridization program as a man, I mean, could that mean because there is no more healthy sperm being ejaculated by the man that all of a sudden... It, that man is no longer necessary. He's he's uh, damaged goods, so to speak. Well, the ejaculation process is one thing, but the product the production is is separate. So that's True. still occurring, and so you know the the means of removing that data it doesn't have to come through you know the ejaculation. It can be taken other ways. So so I don't believe that that would be the end all for everyone that gets a vasectomy because I've heard the opposite. I've heard them get that and still continue to have this kind of contact experiences. Um, because we have to remember that we're dealing with things in an interdimensional plane as much as the physical. The physical is only one aspect. A lot of people have interdimensional contact in their dream state, in astral plane, and they're still participating in some of these programs. So I think that it transcends the laws even of physics of what is physical and real for us, the, the, the boundaries that it presents to us, or the perceived boundaries that are presented. Um, I think it's something that's a little more complex than that. Okay, YJ says, very interesting. And yes, the visitations are still happening to this day to people in his family. Interesting. Yep, there you go. So so this is a family, you know, lineage, the information that's necessary, you know, it's similar information that runs through your your bloodline. So the family is being utilized for those things. It can be a hybridization program, it can be other other kinds of things. But that's very interesting. Thank you for that. I, I just had another listener, I'm going to keep his name out of it for right now. He just mes messaged me on Facebook and he said he's had a vasectomy as well, and, and the extraterrestrials are still coming for him as uh -huh. well. So, I mean, I guess, yeah. it, I guess it goes both ways. It really does. I, yeah, and this is, this is a really fantastic example to help us understand the contractual agreements. That It makes us understand that the kind of agreements that we have with these beings far transcend just any kind of physical limitations that one may think we have. And it means that the laws of creation are very much applicable in that if you still have an agreement with these beings, you're still going to be carrying them out until you, per you know, perceivingly end those agreements with these beings. You know, and they and usually those kinds of agreements are made through the awareness and the unlockingness of uh, the unlocking of your consciousness. The more you wake up, the more you activate your genetic code, the more you can begin to master those levels, those dimensional planes, dream time, sleep time, the Akashic levels, the astral planes. You begin to manage those because you're more lucid in those states. And that's what we want. We want you to remember your contact. You have to remember what you're doing, why you did it. Uh, and that's why it's important to recall. It's important to have hypnotherapy. Lou from Unidentified Celebrity v Review wants to know, says you can't find the alien video on your Facebook. Do you know what date you posted that? Yeah, let me tell you. Um, let's see here. Let me tell you really, really quick, because it wasn't that far. Uh, that would be August 1st. Literally August 1st. So you can check it out. It's on my it's on my uh, Instagram as well. Interesting. See if I can pull that up. Is it under your Geraldine oh. Orozco one? Yeah, it's on my Facebook. If you want, I can share it on the Facebook, and then you can pull it from there if that's easy. Let me see. Well, let's see here. 
Uh, you got like you got like seventy five profiles. Is it on Geraldine no. Y Orozco or Geraldine Orozco Art? Oh, Geraldine Y Orozco. All right. Yeah. Let's see if mm -hmm. we can bring this. Oh yeah, that would be great on the Instagram, Dave. It's just right there. I hope uh, you can. Oh, see there. It. Okay, so for our radio listeners, we'll try and uh, and bring this up here, and well, we'll we'll kind of describe what narrate. is going on and narrate because you know we are professional play-by-play -play artists here on the show, <laughs> and we also do realize that on radio you can't see what we are broadcasting live on YouTube and Twitch, so we have to kind of break it down. Okay, so. Right there, you have a couple of of lights moving right in the yeah. middle of the of the the frame, and they almost look to be in a shape of a triangle. Yeah, it starts off in the shape of a triangle, but I think that the other two are are stars because they don't move. But this one, that's what makes it so interesting, literally moves through those two and then continues gliding across until it finally disappears. You'll see. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So when you have something like that, now, did you feel you called it in? Or did you feel that you had had brought it forward? Because I'm looking at two stars moving on this film, moving towards the one that is stationary. Yeah, so actually it's one moving through the two stars, but it probably looks the other way. See how, see how it literally goes through the two stars and keeps moving across? right above there oh. so um did i call this in not at all i was literally and it just i went grocery shopping i had my grocery bags and something told me as usual this this is how it always happens for me i have this strong feeling to look up and right when i look up i had my keys and my phone in my hand i literally dropped my bags because before this i there was another one that was that uh that moved so quick i couldn't grab it on camera and um as it moved out of my, my vision, I grabbed the camera and this one was still moving across the sky and boom, I was able to catch it. And I was surprised to have the quality that I did just on a regular iPhone. Um, you know, so, uh, and that night, you know, that's, that's when you start having these activities, right? You start having these, uh, I already know. It's like you, you already feel it. The pressure in the room is different. It feels like you're in a bubble. It feels like you're in a balloon. It feels like... You're floating. I almost want to say it feels like you have something like around your, your arms, like your arms are around something. You have this strange pressure in the chest and the ears. Um, and um, it, it's just when, when you lay down, it's, you're immediately brought in between. You're conscious with, with your room and you're conscious with what you're about to experience here. And that's when you start having these kinds of things occur. So it's, it's, it's very weird. Yeah, it's, but, but the thing is that I, these kinds of um, patterns are similar. You know, these patterns, it happens similarly. Well, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I went out. It was We decided late, about 6.30, that we were going to go out driving in the forest just to see what, wow. just to see what we could find. Mm -hmm. I just felt like going into the forest because, I'm going to be honest, the forest is damn well creepy in the, as it gets dark. It really mm -hmm. is. And you don't know what you're going to see. So we right. we head north, and we take this back road where I've been known, and where not I've been known, but I, I've heard of some Sasquatch stories back there. That's what we're looking for. And ahead of us, we, you know, we get into the area, we get onto the logging road, we're driving down, and lo and behold, the this big thunder and lightning storm is going on. Total beautiful pitchfork lightning. Wow coming down and we're just hoping that doesn't start any forest fires but nonetheless we continue on this road we go for about 25 miles you know and we're just relaxing looking to see if we could see anything in the headlights because now it's starting to get dark and it gets a little bit darker in the forest than it does on normal you know normal roads and we get about 25 miles in see nothing but a little rabbit and we turn the vehicle around and shortly after we turn the vehicle around to come back, we I see this on the right side, probably 100 yards up, I see this flash in the trees, like a square orb. 
And it was just there for a quick second. It didn't take off or anything like that. It was just like, bang, there it is, gone. So I I was pointing to it as we were driving right to it. And we pulled up to it, and the energy was bad and weird. Whoa. Yeah, bad, bad energy. Like, Mm -hmm. not, not alien, nothing like that. Not UFO. Just real bad cryptid if you get out of your vehicle i'm gonna rip you apart type energy Whoa. and i like that feeling i'm, I'm not gonna lie <laughs> i do <laughs> right okay so we decide to keep going because it, it was actually quite uncomfortable and it wasn't just me in the vehicle picking it up it mm-hmm. would, and so we decide to keep we start driving and we felt that way for about 18 miles wow like we were being followed And then all of a sudden the energy turned to extraterrestrial type energy. Mm -hmm. Like it felt like a UFO was following us. Amazing. And we come out of the forest and to get back on the pavement. And there's this big thick cloud covering 90% of the moon. And all you see is the top part of the moon. And you know how like in the daytime you could see the sun rays coming out of the off the sun well you could actually see the moon rays it looked wow it looked amazing right and there's another moth here you that's beautiful and and so anyways long story short if the moon was at about mid 12 o'clock on a clock Mm -hmm. way down here at five o'clock there was a white orb sticking out of the clouds Wow. So here we had the the feeling that we were being followed by a UFO. And sure enough, you know, there's this white orb sticking out of the clouds and it eventually sucked itself back in. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So you know what I love about what you're talking about is how you were able to sense the differences in the energies. I mean... What's ET energy? Can you describe? Because I completely agree with you, but I want to know what how you describe that. Okay. Uh, for me, and I don't know how it is for other people, it, mm-hmm. it's very fast energy. It, it's almost like having ADHD and you got to go, you got to go, you got to make it happen. You, and almost like you're getting anxious and having an anxiety attack. And, and at times it's hard to breathe. Not that you're 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 not being able to breathe, but it's just like you can't breathe enough. And and it's like, you know, it's like having a great high, you know, mm-hmm. you know where where you just you got to go, you got to do this, you got to take that plunge, you got to jump off the bridge on the bungee cord, you know, it just you you got to make make it happen, and. That's the way it is for me because I know when I'm around spirits like ghosts, it's very heavy. It's very lethargic on my shoulders. It's draining. It's depressing. It it's uh, it gives you a headache. Where mm. whereas uh, ET type energy yep. is very wiry and it's it's energy like come on let's go we got a destination to hit let's make this thing happen come on boys let's get this thing going right yeah. It's an amazing, adrenaline rush. amazing description, Dave. I agree. I, it almost feels like you're hyperventilating. Almost, yes. it feels like it's a high vibration that you feel in the body. Literally, I agree completely. Very cool. Thanks for explaining that. So that's a, that's the way it is for me. And you yeah. know, being the fact that I've had a Bigfoot experience too, that mm-hmm. en- that energy is very intimidating. Mm. But, but it's not scary. Mm-hmm. It's intimidating. It's it's a respectful energy of respectful yeah of, I hey i could hurt you bad but i'm not going to uh mm-hmm. just don't piss me off uh and the energy that and i've only ever felt this twice and that saturday night was the second time to me wow. to me felt like dogman energy there are dogmen in that area where uh, where oh, I was. Really? Wow! I've never seen one. I don't know if I really want to see one. But I heard. <laughs> but that energy is very, very mean and intimidating. Like I've been around some pretty bad ghosts. I've been attacked by ghosts on mm-hmm. on my ghost tour. Ghosts don't scare me. Mm-hmm. All right, they may startle you, 
where you give a little shriek, but they don't scare me. This energy is scary. Yeah. And yeah. it is intimidating. And it's like, I'm going to really screw you up if you stick around here. And I have felt that twice. Uh, once on the front side of that mountain, now on the back side of that mountain. And I don't like that feeling. It's very, very uncomfortable. Wow. So do you think you're, was it good ETs then? Was it, was it guides that were kind of maybe protecting, shifting the energy? Or no. do you think that they were just, uh, you know, also coming in for the, <laughs> Yeah, they were. I don't know, for a bite? <laughs> they were, uh, as we go to break here, I would yeah. say that they were just watching. Kind of like, ha ha, we, we got our eyes on you. We're going to take more questions from our audience in the chat room on YouTube and on Twitter for Geraldine Orozco as we continue on with the spiritual you right after this in hour two of Spaced Out Radio. Stick around. GeraldineOrozco.com is her website. We'll be right back. All right, we're clear. Okay, cool. You know, oh yeah, it, it's a weird energy. So, what about uh, at night? Did you have any dreams or anything? Nothing. Anything else happened? Nothing. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. No. Nope. Interesting. And the people that you were with, did they have any dreams or anything? No. My little guy was asleep in the back seat. Hi, typical um, watch. How you doing? Yeah, it was. Uh, oh, hold on, Mister Cowley. Da, da, da. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> oh, Mr. Cowley. See, Mr. Cowley loves hey. his spaced out radio. I haven't got the second verse out yet. Oh, got to work on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's my metal voice right there. <laughs> I see. Yes. Yes, I actually like it when he comes in late, so that way I can actually sing it. He loves it. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but uh, that was the first experience I've had in a long time. Wow, and I don't. And, and for the record, I don't know if that was a UFO. I don't. It looked like it, sure. the way it kind of pulled back. I've seen that once before where mm -hmm. I've seen a UFO pull back in the clouds. Well, what else could it be, though? What 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 do you think else would it be? You think it could be a craft know. or an orb? We, or, I well, mean... See, that's the thing. We don't have a lot of planes around here. Okay? Yeah. There's yeah. not a lot of air traffic around here. And if mm -hmm. it is air traffic, it's at about 35,000, 36,000 feet coming from usually Asia, and heading to either Calgary or Toronto, Toronto or mm. Montreal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. So that's where that's where it gets a little bit iffy, and I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's really interesting that it was in clouds. It kind of gives you an idea of mm -hmm. how high it was because airplanes don't really go that high. Like you mentioned, thirty five thousand feet. You know, maximum probably around that area, but. Um, yeah, I mean, these lights, I mean, even the light that I took on the camera, I mean, you're talking about some really, really high lights, you know, it looks like a satellite, but it, yeah. it's moving strangely. And so what object would move into clouds? So it's literally in the hemisphere. The question is, you know, what is it doing there? And well, I mean, here's the thing, you know, from a distance, a cloud looks like it can look like a wall. Mm -hmm. So if I want to be skeptical to myself and realistic, okay, the clouds underneath could have shifted over something. Maybe, I mean, it was too big to be a planet like Jupiter or Venus. Mm -hmm, it it mm -hmm. was much bigger than that. I know we don't have air traffic at night around here. Very rarely do we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it doesn't look like it was that. And then all of a sudden it kind of just like sucked back into the clouds. Maybe the clouds moved over it. I don't know, but it was yeah. it, it was highly out of place because, I mean, it, it, it was like if you took a ruler from the moon to where this light was, it was a good 12, 14 inches. Mm. So it's not like it was close right. to the moon. And it was a thick cloud because the only the only portion of, of the of the sky that you could see through 
was the the top of it where the moon was the into- wow. like you could the cloud was so thick you couldn't see through the cloud to see the moon or there was no light emanating from the moon through the cloud right so i don't know what it was i i tend to think because of the feeling that we had that we were being followed by a ufo that yeah. that it was something uh, coincidental you know mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, i try mm-hmm. you know this is where i laugh at all the people who say that i lie about my experiences and i make them up i always try to debunk my own experiences yeah i understand completely you yeah. know and yeah i think that's a healthy way to interact with these kinds of things too to understand what's happening absolutely yeah. Hi, Tall, Dark, mm-hmm. and Dirty. How are you? Welcome to the chat. You know, and, and, and that's just kind of the thing that uh, it's easy to say you have experiences, but you have to be able to look, you know, skeptically at them to, totally. make, to make sure you're just not making up a bunch of bullshit, you know. Totally. You know, so, I mean, others I others may think differently. The critics will always think differently because they, they only want to believe what they want to believe. But that's okay. Uh, we have about 27 seconds here. I want to say a big thank you to YJ, Simon Times 2, Pascal, and Smithy for the amazing super chats. Really do appreciate uh, earning your listening ears. Thank you so much to all the veterans who are listening into this show. We absolutely love you. And you always got a safe home here. And, of course, all our regulars who are jammed on in into the chat room tonight. Here we go with the second half of the show starting right now. Second half of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. We've kicked things off. Geraldine Orozco is our guest. But first, we want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. As we said earlier, Geraldine Orozco from Bay Area Meditation in San Francisco, California, is our guest tonight. She joins us once a month for The Spiritual You. Her website is GeraldineRosco.com. Geraldine, we're going to start with a question here from Evan. And Evan is asking, why do spirituality and UFOs intersect on so many contact accounts? Oh, Great question. Perfect question. Absolutely. Because this is actually where, and this is what really excites me about the ufology topic, right? When we're talking about contact. And the question, the big question is, you know, well, when you go far down the rabbit holes of spirituality, even when you go down the dark rabbit holes of, of religion and all of these ideas, this, this, the questioning of your purpose, the questioning of a God, is there a God? When you go down those paths, you are met with consciousness at the very end of that tunnel, right? And then you begin to go down the tunnel of uh, UF ufology or contact or ET contact. And at the end of that tunnel, when you get to the end of it, you're also going to be met with consciousness. I think that consciousness is the bridge between all of these unknown things that we're beginning to understand about ourselves. It is the unseen realm, the spiritual realm. And um, whether these are completely separate things or the same thing if we look historically right when we talk about the book of enoch when we talk about the origins of life seeding on this planet when the great descendant giants come down and they breed with mankind in order to create the human race when you begin to look at all of these possibilities of how we we earth was created you begin to understand that maybe there is a connection there that maybe those great giants or that evolved consciousness um, is is actually extraterrestrials or interdimensionals. I like to call them interdimensionals. I don't really stick to the idea of extraterrestrials because terrestrial, the Earth, is, is a very 
It's a limited plane in that in order to explain U UFOs, UAPs, and how they navigate, it means that our physics don't apply. They just simply do not apply. So that means that we need to navigate by other laws, other, other laws of navigation, other laws of physics, maths, all of these things are put into question. So we are dealing with other dimensional laws. And um, when we talk about the human and, and when they leave the safety of the physical environment that is known to them, many things become activated. Psychic abilities become activated. Many contactees, uh, like myself, for example, you're taken and you're activated all these psychic abilities from one moment to the next. These things are a product of contact because the human body is being removed from their dimensional environment into another dimension. And as a result of that, DNA is activated. There are lots of things are activated in the human body and then placed back into reality in order to merge these two. So um, if you begin to um, interview many contactees, it's incredible the parallels between their spiritual journey and ET contact. And I think that it's, it really plays a role in our understanding of what consciousness is. Consciousness, this thing that cannot be defined, this thing that cannot be pinpointed. But in fact, when you look at it as nothing and everything at once, it begins to make sense. It's in that, that zero point that you begin to understand that we are just one aspect of a, a rainbow of possibilities of the manifestation of consciousness. Um, so th that's my take on it. Okay, so if that's your take, and, and I, I think that's very, very truthful, do you think then that ETs, or let, let me rephrase that, I always like to put it that the minute we open up to the experience and accept the experience, that it's almost like a Kmart blue light special beacon that shoots a billion miles into the stars that lets everything know that we can be contacted. Is that uh -huh. kind of what you're saying here, that it opens us up to any type of possibility? Yes, I am. And, and let me tell you, there's a genetic part of that, and there's also the psychological intuitive part of that okay but we're talking about the same thing what is your holographic dna as a blueprint of all the potential things that you could possibly experience and even imagine or experience in the non-physical and so um not only is is our contact et contact experience encoded in our genetics because it runs down family lineages which means that our family have been dealing with these kinds of beings this intelligence for centuries maybe since the origin of life so all of that remember it's encoded so the moment that a contactee that is the descendant of a contactee becomes aware of their contact experience what is actually happening is that DNA is literally being activated. Information is being coming from the suppressed state into an open space. It's coming into uh, the data that's being read into your reality. And so what that means is that you're tapping into information that also affects the physical body. When you are no longer in resistance to this data that is literally a part of your blueprint, you allow everything that results as a result of that acceptance. Accepting acceptance as an energy frequency is a very fluid energy. It's a very expansive energy. It allows you to stop looking at things from a myopic perspective into a more broad perspective. And just in that acceptance, it allows you to activate the genetic code so that your intuition can now move more fluidly. Your, your Intuitive abilities are heightened, and so that means that you are now more open to interacting with other dimensional planes, whether it's ghosts, whether it's ETs, whatever it is, for most contactees, they become incredibly sensitive to everything. You know, people's energy is more empathic, but even mediumship becomes a part of their life as well. They begin to become contact with uh, deceased people, you know. And so all of these things are a part of the activation of our genetic code, of our superhuman powers that are available to us. So so a lot of things are being activated, but it it, it the stem of that information is in your genetic code. All right, let's get to Patsy's question. 
As a child, she says, I woke up to something like a black cloud of flying little black swarm dots or insects. I felt great oppressive emotion or energy. What do you think that could have been? Wow, interesting. Black swarm or dots. I mean, that is very interesting. The last time I heard of something similar to this, there are two things that come to mind. Number one, um, kind of like an artificial intelligence that is directed in a sense. And... Um, what comes to mind is black goo, actually, okay? And and what black goo is, it's a, it's a very conscious substance, okay? And it's programmable. It's like a computer code that can be programmed in order to carry out any number of things. But why this comes to, to my mind is because I had a contactee uh, a couple years ago that talked about um, this kind of cloud similar to what you're talking about but little dots that look like mosquitoes or like little little gnats and it would feel like it would come over the body but when it would come over the body it would cause them heat it would cause the body to heat up and immediately they would have this missing time as a result of this passing of energy and uh, begin to recall activities that they had as a child so I would love to know more about your experience exactly. You know, what, what happened? Um, did you have any memories? Did you have any side effects? Did you have missing time? Did you have dreams the nights after you had that contact? There are many ways that this kind of consciousness can manifest itself. But we have to remember that there are also terrestrial programs that are utilizing mind control and utilizing some kind of very, very advanced nanotechnology in order to implement into our reality things that interact with us. And we may not be aware of it. So it could be it could be this as well. So uh, I'm not sure, but it could be something like that. All right, let's move on to another question. Lou, <coughs> excuse me, is asking... When I had my experience, I didn't feel any conscious connection. Does this only happen when actual contact is made? Um, no. So conscious connection, does this only happen when actual contact is made? No. Um, your ability to recall the experience has nothing to do with whether the experience was completely physical or etherical or etheric. Okay, so we might have experience in the physical, we may not remember it. We might have experiences in the etheric realm, and we may not remember it as well. Remember that the technology and the fact that you're leaving the physical body or leaving the physical dimension will definitely uh, oftentimes not only scramble up the experience, but you're also dealing with the technology and the intelligence of these beings that have the ability of suppressing those memories in order to preserve this is also a natural mechanism of the human body that when it when it comes into an environment with an overwhelming experience that you know they can't place into their current reality we begin to check out and it's the fight or flight mode that begins to kind of block those memories from coming in so um you know obviously this intelligence utilizes that mechanism in order to suppress memories further um and it isn't usually until you go into hypnotherapy and begin to release those suppressed memories that you begin to remember. But I would look for other signs. What else happened? How do you know you had contact? Did you have any physical marks on the body? Did you have any other symptoms? Um, did you have a sighting earlier that evening? You know, what are some of the other things that occurred um, that led up to that experience? And kind of run through that to understand it a little better. All right, Mitchell is uh, making a comment type question. I've seen something that looked like a white sock fly and drop then take off like a fighter jet it was up there no joke came down like it had mass almost sounds wow, like a tic tac yeah and where does mitchell live like what area can you tell us where you live well, that's very interesting yeah we'll have to find out more because there is the delay in the chat room yeah yeah well if you can you know I i'm mean, always let, well mm. while we're waiting for that let's get to kira's question what are the silver tiny orbs that show up around me and flow like water around me? They move when I move like little tiny beings. So the amazing thing about working with orbs or energy like this is that 
first of all, it's an extension of ourselves. We have to remember everything that we experience, even these interdimensional things are an extension of ourselves. We're projecting something, something that either we are experiencing in another dimension, something that we've experienced in a past life, simultaneous life, or something that we're calling in due to our resonance in this current moment. So a couple of things that I would ask is what are the emotions that you tend to have right before leading into the moment where you begin to connect with these orbs. And if your emotion is set in joy and love, um, a lot of times these are a confirmation for you. They are a confirmation and they are uh, perhaps guides or higher vibrational aspects of yourself that are coming into that space. But it's not just the surface emotion. It's the subconscious emotion. So if let's say you have a smile on your face, but in the back of you, you're actually distressed or anxious or fearful in some way. Remember that this is actually the emotion that's calling and becoming a match to whatever you're experiencing. So just notice that. And in what I've experienced with my clients with orbs, what I see is that when people are activating their spiritual abilities, when they're working on themselves, a lot of times they will have orbs more often come into their space. And basically what's happening is that you're lifting the veil between the physical and the non-physical for you to see what is happening. In reality, we are surrounded by orbs, surrounded by light, surrounded by all kinds of things at all times. But because our vision is so externalized, um, we fail to be able to, to tune in to those things. So as you wake up more and more, more sightings, more things like this um, will become available to you. You can also wake up and be fearful and not want to see them. So if you choose not to see them also, you know, when you wake up, you have to choose to see them and be okay with seeing that unknown thing without fear. Could they be little protectors sent by guides? Absolutely, absolutely. But again, see, the way I look at it is that guides are an extension of yourself. Guides are you. In my mind, guides are you. They are fragments of yourself the higher vibrational aspects of yourself that are operating to guide you, to work with you, to send you things. You know, they might send you a feather, a bird for you to see or something, confirmation or even numbers, right, that help you feel an, an, an awakening, an awareness. All of these clues are for us to remember ourselves, to become awake every moment of our, of our life. So use those clues and, and don't be afraid to tune in to them. If you see the orbs, Tune in intuitively, ground yourself, protect yourself, tune in and see what is the interaction that's necessary with whatever it is that you're seeing and experiencing. That's very interesting. Uh, Geraldine Orozco is here tonight, our guest on The Spiritual You. Uh, back to Mitchell's comment there about the UFO sock. He said it happened in, oh, yeah. Fa in Phelan, California. Oh, interesting. So right over here. Wow. So Tic Tac. So the Tic Tac happened down here, Southern California as well, right? Yes. That happened near Catalina Island. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't mind the siren. That's coming in on my end there. No problem. Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, there's a lot of activity down there in Southern in Cal in on this coast, on the west coast as well. I mean I, I think that we have uh bases underneath. Um, the earth that go into the ocean. And not only have I seen that myself, but um, many people claim that they have seen craft that go into the ocean, in and out of the ocean, and a lot of activity around California. So I think it's prime location for it. All right, let's get to Max's question. Is there a danger to repetitive regression if memories are surfacing from prior blocks? So, first of all, working with a very experienced um, hypnotherapist, um, and what I mean by experience is somebody that has dealt with contact before, because um, they need to understand not all hypnotherapies, therapists are going to be okay with going back to these memories. And in fact, if you go to a proper hypnotherapy school, they will tell you never go back to traumatic memories and relive those experiences. Because a lot of times, um, you know, the mind, because of the trauma, can really, you know, if, if, the, if the person says something that can lead you into a thought, 
For example, did you see ETs? If they ask you that when you're in hypnotherapy, that's already leading you into experiencing something. So you have to be very careful when you're working with the hypnotherapist so that they understand how to navigate that in a way that will help guide you into the true aspect of your experience. But is there, um, that being said, um, repetitive, no. Um, because once you have integrated an experience that has happened, and in order to integrate, all that means is that you're understanding what happened. Hypnotherapy is very powerful in that you are literally receiving information in more than one way. You're hearing things, you're experiencing things, sometimes you're seeing things. And so you're going to have a very complete overview of what is occurring there why you're there, you know, what these beings are doing, how you're interacting with them. So what that integration helps you do is helps you accept in a very profound way what you've experienced. Once the human psyche has gotten to that point of acceptance, it is easier for them to move forward from any trauma that is suppressed from those experiences. So if you continue to do regression therapy, you're never going to go back to the exact same memory unless you haven't integrated from that trauma. If there is still trauma, it means that you weren't led into the key elements of that experience that caused the trauma. It means you've only surfaced it or, you know, and that's why it takes an experienced hypnotherapist to know how to get to that root. Um, and so when you're moving through the memories, um, usually you will progress and you will keep moving. And sometimes you will encounter metaphor-like experiences that will help you translate the kind of experience that you had. The brain is very intelligent and it will never put you in a, in a, in a situation in which um, is unsafe for you. We have mechanisms that block us from going into places. So if you have a trauma in a place where it would cause you harm, more than likely you, you won't even be able to go into that memory. So again, you just have to be very mindful of, of what you're doing and why you're doing it uh, when you go into regression. The thing that scares me about regression is being led on by the questions. Right. Yeah, that's that's a wrong thing to do. Well, yeah. and I understand that's a wrong thing to do, and and there's only a couple people I would trust with that, Nam mm -hmm. namely the two biggest names would probably be Leslie Mitchell Clark and Barbara Lamb. And mm -hmm. Barbara's great, you know. But but I mean, for the rest out there who've never dealt with this, I mean, how do we know we're getting treated fairly during a regression? Yeah, I think that it's a very unique field. Uh, this is the exact reason why I myself became certified in hypnotherapy, because not only did I become fearful of who I was working with, but I began to realize that the mind is very, you have to be very careful. And so anytime that the way that you ask the questions always have to be very intuitively in tune with the subject and what they're trying to achieve with that session. So the questions have to be very carefully placed. And, um, you know, I, and I honestly, with even with my experience, like the way I ask the questions, you have to do it in a way that is um, very, in a way, general, but still bringing them into that area uh, for them to navigate on their own, on their own. They have to be able to navigate on their own what they find there. So you're not impl implanting any ideas, any fears, any thoughts as you lead them. Um, but somebody has to understand the phenomena. They also have to understand trauma. People that understand, uh, hip therapists that are understand trauma are also very good at knowing that they are not going to use the the subject in order to guide their subjects through um, you know, the topic of healing in the subject. They're not going to guide the subject utilizing the topic that's being used for healing. Um, in fact, you just uh, create a very safe space for them to view from afar what they need to see. Another great hypnotherapist is also Misha Johnston. She does, she does a yes. great job. Um, and uh, Lori McDonald as well does, does, does a great job. All right, let's get to Ian's question. I have been waking up with a terrifyingly thumping heartbeat, and I don't remember my dream till hours after I wake up. Very interesting dreams that coincide with my daily life. Divine or health issues? Your, your mm, thoughts. Interesting. Well, remember, uh, again, we want to understand that, you know, all 
illnesses have some kind of somatic roots, okay? So we need to be mindful of that. And I think that more and more the medical field is is tuning into that awareness, okay? We're tuning into that awareness because there's becoming a merging between the Eastern medicine and the Western medicine, okay? And we're becoming aware that the body is much more complex than just utilizing medicine to suppress symptoms, but understand the root. And a lot of the roots of physical ailments are within the emotional. So something that I'd love for you to notice is what is the primary emotion that comes up for you in the dream? You don't even need to remember what happened. I just want you to notice what you felt in that dream. That emotion, I want you to take a look and see, is that emotion something that you've been feeling in the past year in your life, the past day, the past month, the past year, and begin to trace it back. How often do you feel this kind of an emotion? What are the things that trigger it? Is it a woman, a man? Is it a specific place that trigger that emotion? What you're going to find is a pattern. And this pattern oftentimes will take you back to childhood in which, uh, you know, you will have experienced a very similar thing that caused a trauma and you are constantly reliving because we're trapped in that cycle. Oh, go ahead. Geraldine, we're going to get you to hold on. We got Geraldine and Roscoe for another 30 minutes. Then we're going to join the shift in Vancouver, go right across Canada to talk some UFOs. We'll be back with Hour 3 of Spaced Out Radio next. I don't know what the hell is happening in my area, but there, the volunteer fire department got called and there was other ve- oh, no. emergency vehicles uh, driving around here. Wow, I hope it's not a fire or anything. Yeah, I hope not. I hope Is not. it hot up there? No, it's cooled right down. Mm. It's like single digits in the morning now. It feels great. Really? <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. So uh, the other morning it was like 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So 4 <sighs> degrees Celsius. It was oh, beautiful. Oh, my gosh. It was beautiful. September. I'm like, I'm like finally. <laughs> finally. Dave. <laughs> Somebody was anxious for the snow to go away, I remember, last year. You try four and a half months worth of snow. (laughs) Oh, I know. I know. You do not know. (laughs) Well, that's true. I don't know. But I'm okay not knowing. (laughs) No. I mean, the first two months, okay, are fantastic. After the third month, you're like, okay, getting a little tired. The fourth month, okay, so we'll, we'll start getting heavy snow in late uh-huh. November, early December. And we'll have a beautiful white Christmas. You know, nothing like going out into the snow, finding a, a, a tree, and, mm-hmm. and and going from there. <clears throat> I think it's beautiful. And it's beautiful, it yeah, is. sure. And, and then, you know, uh, seeing the, the, like, the, the, the mountain lion tracks around the tree that you're trying to cut down, that's always fun. <laughs> and... And so, but you know, when you fire up the chainsaw, wow. when you fire up the chainsaw, then you, you, they're not coming around. Mm-hmm. They're not coming around. But nonetheless, I love that part. And then you got your, you know, January. Okay, winter looks good. It's still fun. It's, you know, not very cold. And then February comes and you hit that cold spurt where, you know, for those two and a half to maybe three weeks, <clears throat> it gets very, very cold. Mm-hmm. That's where it gets down to like almost forty degrees minus forty oh, Fahrenheit. Oh my gosh! How is that possible? And, and that's yeah. that's not fun. That's yeah. not fun. That hurts. I'll be honest with you. Like yeah. you don't you don't want to be outside very long when that happens. And oh, and, and then so once once you get out of that cold spurt and then it starts to warm up, it's uh, you know you're like okay it's up to minus like because you've been so cold for so long. When it hits that, let's say, 25 to to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, where you can actually, like, walk around in the cold in a T-shirt and it doesn't bug you. <laughs> and that's where you kind of like, come on, let, like, let's get this thing going. And then next thing you know, you're, you're mid-April, early, you know, going into late April, and you're like, okay, like, that's enough. That's enough. And then mid-April, you finally start to see the remnants of the melt. And then it snows again. And you like, you dirty bastard, Mother oh, Nature. Oh, my right? goodness. And then you're like, okay, it's starting to melt again. And then it snows again. And you're like, come on. 
And then, you know, you're getting all excited because you want to plant your flowers and you go spend a bunch of money on the flowers, but you can't plant your flowers because they have a thing around here called uh, breakup. What breakup uh-huh. is, is when the permafrost decides to mm-hmm. finally melt because you can't plant anything when it hasn't melted properly. Oh my gosh. Mm. So, wow. Yeah. So that, that <laughs> takes how long for that permafrost? Mid-May. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So May to September, that's what you guys have, and that's it. That's it. Wow. That's it. And then in August, you know, uh, July is usually burning month, you know. (laughs) Can't even have a summer around here anymore without the burning. Oh, my goodness. My first two years up here were gorgeous. I mean, I'm Mm -hmm. not going to move. I love it up here. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. But you get sick if and tired I could of tolerate walking. the cold, I would move up there too because it's just so incredible. It's a theory. Mm-hmm. It's a theory. Well, you've been to Whistler. Yeah, yeah, it's divine. It's okay. beautiful. Take away, but the... I haven't been there in winter though. No, but if you take away the chalets and and all the fancy stuff and just look at the trees and the mountains, that's what I live in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that's the most beautiful part. But <laughs> yeah, that's what I live in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whistler minus. Minus the million dollar homes. Right. <clears throat> and uh, $500 a night rooms. <laughs> Obscene. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's ridiculous. We got 90 seconds. Okay. We got about a minute, and uh, we'll get to uh, uh, Super Lou's question next. I'm just scrolling down here to see what else we got here. <clears throat> if you're having an egg for dinner, Brett Lewis, that means you're having breakfast foods for dinner. Sorry, Hector in Mexico. How are you, my friend? Yeah, who else do we got here? Pikachu, good to see you back. Uh, that's not orbs. That was another moth. Sage Necro, good to see you. <laughs> and uh, well, let's see here. Uh, Nikki, you're missing uh, Barbara Lamb. Thank you to Spooky, to YJ, Simon Times 2, Pascal, and Smithy. For the great super chats, thank you to all the veterans tuned in. Here we go with the hour number three, everyone. Let's have a good one. Get your horns up. Bumblefoot is coming. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. I want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the Spaced Out Radio uh, SOR Space Travelers Club. Paydudic. Paydudic is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We'll have a new look as of next week, thanks to Geraldine and Ben. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. It looks gorgeous. And of course, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, spacedoutradio.com. We've got a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirky Poo's Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Geraldine Orozco. The spiritual you is something we do at the beginning of each month to talk about our zen, our chi, and our extraterrestrial overlords that continue to haunt us on a nightly basis. Geraldine's website is GeraldineOrozco.com. Geraldine, we're going to continue with some audience questions here. And this one coming from Lou in California. 
You've seen the underwater bases. What process did you see them? Remote viewing? Were you on a craft? Or do you mean like scuba diving? <laughs> uh, this is remote viewing. And um, this is something that when I was at the age of eight, I had this experience when I was taken um, in into this underground base with these draconian beings that blindfolded me and put me inside of um, this very like large space with black substance underneath me. And as I'm there, um, projected on the, the, uh, this wall made out of uh, stone inside of this cave was basically everything that was in my mind being projected, everything that I was seeing through the remote viewing projected. I, I have a painting of this I, I actually made because it was very impressive. And what was being shown was that there a sector of the military was working in moving these gigantic black discs um, into these underground bases. And they would take them from the beach, from the coast, into these caverns here along the California coast, but also in uh, up the Ireland coast, the north of Ireland. And they were the same kind of procedure because I believe that there is an underground base in Ireland, northern UK, um, and it connects all the way down to Europe in the same way that the caves here connect into an underground system that go underneath the U.S. and into the major dumps, the underground bases that go along the southern western um, uh, part of the U.S. So all of these are interconnected networks, and there's a lot of movement there where they move nuclear waste. Uh, a lot of different kinds of programs are kind of being kind of carried out in that space. Military program, dark military programs, um, and so yeah, so so that's that's what I saw. So many, but what was interesting and in how I confirmed this understanding, what I saw was that many contactees were seeing off the coast of California these sightings of craft that could go into water. I've heard many cases of this, so you know I'm not the only person that experienced that from a remote view perspective. People are actually seeing that occur. And always in the same areas off the coast of Mount Shasta on the, the coast that, that's, uh, you know, up the northern coast of California and up the southern coast by the Catalina Island, by those areas right there specifically, there seems to be openings in that space. So, yeah. All right. I want, I want to ask you this great question from Evan. How do you deal with energy vampires and sociopaths? Amazing question and very timely for our times right now. I think that with the pandemic, a lot of us have been cooped up at home and maybe in more proximity close to, you know, our, our family, relatives, friends, families, and and maybe partners that perhaps are a bit toxic within these realms of energy vampires. And the way that I look at them is that they are unconscious, imbalanced exchanges of energy, Okay. How do you look at these people? Well, I, I want you to remember, hurt people hurt people. So what the way we want to look at any kind of parasitic consciousness is in an understanding that what becomes parasitic becomes that way because they have forgone, they have completely forgotten that they are a creator self and they require from anything outside of themselves in order to become whole, in order to feel complete, to fill in that emptiness within. That emptiness within is the lack of love, the inability to understand love, to embody love, to feed love into themselves. And this is what is the root and the seed that causes parents in order to become very uh, abusive towards children and then eventually children become abusive towards their children and so on and so forth. And so we keep going in this horrible cycle in our society where we create more psychopaths, more narcissists, more energy vampires, more people that are unaware of their empowerment and creating these unconscious exchanges. How do we look at them? So if this most of these people that have evolved into these kinds of par parasit par parasites, to not to say parasite, but the parasitic consciousness, um, you know, they have stopped evolving emotionally and psychologically at the age in which the trauma was the highest.
And so what has happened is that they keep reliving the emotions up until that age, and that's all they are. So in other words, they behave like children, and they play out like children without the awareness of themselves, without the awareness of others, without understanding how they hurt others, without being aware of how to be conscious of other people's emotions. Compassion is just not in the language because they haven't been taught that. They've never seen it before. So we have to remember that it's like dealing with children. So when you look at these hurt people in that way, it allows you to understand that the responsibility in that relationship is in you. You either choose to engage with your energy, your attention and emotions in these toxic relationships, or you choose to own your space and create boundaries based on the choices and how you speak, you, and you act, you behave, but more importantly, wherever your energy is going. If your energy is focused on resisting this relationship or, you know, creating barriers or toxicity throughout your day, you're intoxicating yourself more so than the other person. Because these people, most of the time, they're disconnected with those emotions. They won't even go through that process. Go ahead, Dave. What, what, if, what if it's not you being the starter of that? What, what, what if it's you getting thrown this negative energy at you out of jealousy, out of rage, out of opportunity you know i mean there's a lot of anger out there especially in this field we we have seen a ton of anger recently move towards the experiencers and their experiences in this field hmm. and you know in in calling out basically people starting to call up all experiencers a bunch of liars oh really yeah and, and who's and, doing and, that <laughs> well you know the show next door or whatever i, I you know okay but there are people out there because we've made we've actually been talking about that quite a bit with with other experiential guests mm. and including our friend Lorian Fenton who is noticing mm. it as well. So I mean, with with how do you deflect that negative energy or that or those those pot shots if you're not the root of the cause? I mean, you can only keep your shield up for so long. Well, that's actually where the key is, right? Because um, why do we have a shield to begin with? Okay, if we have a shield, it means that we think we need to protect something. It means that we believe that something can be taken away or something can be affected. So remember, the law of the universe is everything begins and ends with you. If you feel powerless, helpless, if you doubt yourself, if you doubt you know, the world, reality, if you doubt things, especially yourself, you're always going to attract these same people that are parasitic, feeding off that fear, that doubt in the self. It begins with doubt. When we doubt ourselves, we, we basically create these holes in our auric field that begin to drain the life force out of ourselves. And anyone that is in that same energy comes in and takes a nice little chunk out of there. And they can throw this energy at you. They can do all these things. The moment that you begin to own your space, the moment that it doesn't matter if people are throwing a bottle at you, it will not affect you. It will not affect you in that same way. This is the power that the human has to understand right now, especially with everything that's happening in the world. There are no victims. There are no victims because the moment that you become aware that you are in the middle of something here, there's the choice and you have to make that choice. Either you participate or you don't participate. When you stop giving energy to them, what are they going to do? They're eventually going to get tired and find another victim that believes they're a victim and continue to propel that belief system and feed off that belief system. So, you know, we actually have much more participation in this kind of parasitic behavior than we believe. And so, especially talking about the contact thing, we need to stay strong and we need to stick together in that, you know, at this moment, I, I don't can't even imagine who would possibly be questioning contactees at this time. Such a critical time when the government has, uh, you know, basically said that there are, uh, you know, this kind of uh, UAPs and whatever. Um, it's a confirmation for all of us, and it's a time for everyone to take a nice step back and begin to question consciousness and reality and contact and what that means to each individual. Um, but, yeah, so, I don't know. 
Hatrin <laughs> says, wow, Geraldine Orozco is a guru. Dave Scott, quickly take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. <laughs> My shoes have been off the entire show. Oh, uh, you're... Yes. How do you say your name? Ager, Ageran? Ageran, I believe. Ageran. What a beautiful name. Bledso. Ageran Belesto. Thank you. Yes. So sweet. And if you saw my socks tonight, you'd be totally impressed. Oh, my gosh. What kind of socks are you wearing? I, I got brand new <laughs> socks this weekend. Uh, <laughs> wow. So Mr., nice. Mr., Mr., Mr. Moneybags from Monopoly. They're Monopoly socks. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. It's good motivation. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, that's that's something that I do. I, I'm wearing these. I'm rocking them today. I, I love, love it. I love socks with patterns on them. I oh, mean, that's so great. I love that. Yes, me too. Geraldine Orozco is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Uh, we have her for about another 10 minutes here. You know, uh, speaking of, of uh, what it's like, what, what about grounding? How does grounding help us deflect that energy, deflect the, that negativity, and, and bring us, you know, and calm us from the, the aggravation and the nervousness and the agitation that is brought by negativity? Yeah, so grounding, basically, you know, uh, it's become such a cliche word. And what happens when words become cliche is that we move away from what the basics and what the truths of those words are, okay? Grounding basically means being fully in your body, being fully present. And so the that that kind of level of awareness, all I, I would like for you to do when you're trying to be a, grounded, a technique that you can use, tap into your five senses. What are you hearing? What are you smelling? What are you seeing? What are you sensing? What are you tasting? And when you tap into those senses, I want you to rotate through them. First, slowly, awareness. So first, see hear, you know, whatever you're hearing, whatever you're seeing, tasting, and then I want you to rotate really fast. The person observing all of those things is the you. That's the true self. So grounding is exercising that awareness in such a way at all times, interacting in your everyday life, that your self, the true core self that is the observer, is now coming into the picture because that's actually the creator that's actually the power that the human has the intuitive abilities come online the body comes to regulate we become more calm less stress we begin to make choices without fear that's the power that the human has that now doesn't have to be living in this in the first three chakras of survival but begins to live from the heart the throat and the intuitive self these upper chakras are the management of the higher realms that's what we want to be navigating at where we want to see the world otherwise we're in survival helplessness overwhelmed by emotions that we can't even understand or control and it becomes chaos and we lose grasp of what is real because the only the only thing that's real is the observer at that center point of the self so that's what grounding is, and that's that's kind of what we want to remember. The most powerful, simple tool that you can do. How do you do it? Is it is it by meditation? Is it by walking on uh, Mother Earth and bare feet? Mm -hmm. So as I was mentioning, it's just a matter wherever you are, whatever you're doing, practice by tuning into your five senses and rotate through them as fast as possible. The person observing those senses, that's the you. That's who you want to connect with, the observer. Um, and you can do this uh, at the beginning. It's going to be, it's going to feel a little disconnected because it'll show you how disconnected you are to your body and how disconnected you are to awareness. But as you practice it more and more, it'll become really, really easy. And you'll notice that you are remembering the self. This is the key. Just how many times do you remember yourself? Sometimes in the morning I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to remember myself all day long. But by the time I get to my first client of the day, psh, I don't even know how I got there. You know, I completely forgot I was great up until I got into the shower. And then after the shower, I don't even know how I, you know, got dressed, comb my hair, because we lack awareness. So the thing is that we want to be present. We want to remember ourselves every moment right now. What are we doing? How are we feeling? What are the emotions? Literally, what are your feet doing? What are your toes doing what are your legs your back you know where are you where what are you doing here and just becoming taking a moment to observe the body almost as if you're looking at yourself from the third person perspective in your chair 
this is the total 360 view that you want to have of yourself. And that's the awareness that we want to maintain throughout the entire day. Interesting. Interesting. So how cleansing is that? And how long should we be doing that? All the time, every day. Okay. And, and what, what's going to happen, and this is what uh, I discovered, is that when I started doing that, throughout my day, it began, it began, began to become a habit. And I started to become lucid in dream time. So even in my dreams, I was dreaming something, I don't know, walking along a grassy place. Next thing I know, I was like, Oh, I need to remember myself. And I began to have lucid dreams and started to direct myself in those dreams. That's how you begin to practice the next level of awareness. So this is where we want to reach because remember that our everyday life is just one part of ourselves, of our reality. We're actually operating on many dimensions. But before we deal with those, we need to learn how to master this one uh, uh, dimension, right? And so that's like when you get up in the morning, when you're going to lunch, when you're, you know, cooking, when you're running errands, going to work. Remember yourself. Be present. Remember, check in with yourself and notice what the observer is observing. And that's, that's kind of a, of course, nature is a great way to do that. Um, it's a great way, but not a lot of us, some of us have such busy lives. You know, we don't have time to go out in nature all the time, which is unfortunate. But a way to regulate your body in an instant is by just doing this practice wherever you are. How do pets help with grounding? That's a good question. Um, what pets actually do, pets are fragments of ourselves. They are here to assist your evolution. They are here to help you, uh, you know, somehow uh, carry any kind of heavy emotional burden a lot of times. And so um, oftentimes pets will end up with some illnesses sometimes. And a lot of times those illnesses are illnesses that would have been in our bodies if they were not, if we didn't have that pet. It's an agreement that is created with some of these animals, these living beings, which is very incredible. Um, but these animals, what they're mostly there to do is to help remember how to love, how to embody the vibrational frequency of love. Anytime that you see an animal embody its expression freelessly without doubt without resistance that's the example that we want to learn from our pets and we want to become like that animal that it just you know very freely stretches itself eats the food without guilt without shame without any of these complex emotions that the human has and it maintains its life its balance we want to learn that from pets and every time we connect with them feel love feel this feeling of connection with ourselves and the divine that's what we are we are that creative life force energy but that is hard for a lot of us to to figure out it, it really is geraldine i mean we're so busy we're so tied into our own life uh, it, it's very, very uh, difficult for us to concentrate on. And that's part of the problem. You know what I'm saying? I mean, where do we find the time? I mean, most of us barely have time to take our dogs for a walk and or, or, or to spend time with our cats. But, I mean, it always seems that pets know when things are, are right and when things are wrong. And they, they always seem to be there when things are wrong. Exactly. So that that's something that we don't even have to work at. True. It's a part of the agreement. It's a part of the agreement that we made with the animal and the animal has made with you. It's something very it's it's a consciousness that's operating on its own calendar. So there's really not anything that you have to do with that. But in terms of becoming present, um it's not something that should be compartmentalized. It's something that should be right now. So you're talking to me, you're grounded, you're aware of yourself. You're not just looking at what's happening in the screen, but you're also aware of yourself in your body and your emotions. This is, this is the key to health. If we want to be healthy, if we want to manifest abundance, love, uh, creation, be successful, these are the laws of creation that we need to use and abide by. And they're ancient laws that are, pro, that are, are proven. You know, all the great, you know, greatest uh, gurus and, and everything and all the most successful people in the world utilize these same tools. You know, they understand them. Very true. We only have 90 seconds with you tonight. Flown on by once again. And yeah. once again, it's always a pleasure to have you on this show. And I feel so blessed and honored to to have you be a part of us on a monthly basis. Tell our audience okay. where they can find your websites, YouTube channel, etc. 
Yeah, thank you so much. If you'd like to get a hypnotherapy session with me and work with me in integration, you can reach me at GeraldineOrosco.com. I also facilitate DNA reprogramming. And if you are a contactee and if you are looking to understand your contact experience, you can check out HybridMother.com for our once a month support group and for our upcoming app that will be released at the end of this month. I'll also be speaking at WisdomCon, which I'm producing at the end of this month. Please come check it out. We have some amazing speakers that will be talking about everything from e ETs, consciousness, intergalactic communication, light language, vibrational healing. It is a workshop and lecture in uh, one after the other. So you're moving, you're actually actively practicing what you're learning in the lectures. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you here on this show. And this is why we love having you each and every month. The, the wisdom that comes from you is just so impeccable that... You know, it's hard to bring others on the show to talk about it because we have our own guru in Geraldine Orozco, and we, we so appreciate you. Love you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Davey. Much uh, love to you and to all our listeners. Always. Always. Take care. Geraldine Orozco, everybody. GeraldineOrozco.com to find out more about this beautiful soul that we call Geraldine on the spiritual you. We'll talk to Geraldine at the beginning of October. Coming up next, we're going to join Vancouver, and we're going to go right across Canada with Shane and the ship, talk some UFOs, then we'll get to the Newswire and the Thought of the Day, a jam-packed final half hour of Spaced Out Radio, continues right after this. You are wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much, Davey. So happy to be here. So you're launching your website? When is that? Uh, Next Monday, we're going to launch it. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to hear that he was able to help you finish it. That's a wonderful, Davey. Not a problem. Not a problem. I'm liking Beautiful. this Davey thing. You've never called me Davey. I like it. Really? Really? Can I call you that? Of I didn't even ask. Did. Okay. <laughs> you, you you have permission. You have permission. <laughs> nice. All right. So lucky. Yes. Okay, uh, Ger- I'll see you. For our audience, Geraldine comes on the first Tuesday of every month. So she's a regular guest here. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, Okay. Okay, much love. See you're you later. You're beautiful. Bye. Take care. Bye. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I'm going to step away for a couple of seconds here. I have to pee so bad that I can't sit still. I'll be right back.
I feel so much better. Where's my... There we go. Oh, I can breathe. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, Geraldine is pretty special. She's pretty awesome. That's for sure. And, uh, uh, we're pretty glad to have her here every month. We really are. Uh, that would be kind of weird if the gnome moved, that's for sure. <coughs> she has never called me Davy before. Oh my gosh. I was dying. Absolutely dying there for a few minutes. Holy cow. I honestly thought I might pee myself. Uh, Greco was here the other night there, Tammy. He was here the other night. <coughs> <coughs> All right. And uh, we got like 20 seconds. Big thank you to Evan, to Spooky, YJ, Simon Times 2, Pascal, and Smithy for the amazing super chats. Really appreciate everything that you guys do. Thank you to all the veterans. We're going to hook up with Vancouver here momentarily. Here we go. Heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Usually at this time, once a month, we join Shane Hewitt and The Shift. We're going to go right across Canada and talk about some UFOs, as Shane likes to call them. We're still a little bit uh, upset with Shane after he shaved his beard a couple of months ago, but we'll let it go. We'll let it go. Shane, how you doing? Dave Scott. Oh, my favorite handsome-faced friend. Oh, no, beard-faced friend. Handsome beard-faced friend. That got weird. It was meant to be a compliment. Hi, Dave. Well, I, I actually had to trim my beard the other day because uh, we're doing this whole YouTube thing now over the past while where we broadcast live on YouTube, and literally I had a a listener, or pardon me, a guest who was uh, hearing impaired. And because my beard was thick, she wasn't going to be able to read my lips. So I had to trim my beard in order to have my guest on. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I've heard that before. In fact, I was at a speaking event, and the uh, the hearing person had a hearing aid, and they had a, a wireless receiver that they put up at the front by the speakers to help get a little bit of a boost of the audio because of the fact at the time I had my beard and my mustache, and it was very, very difficult for her to to read my lips like that. We take that for granted, don't we? We totally do. And I don't mind shaving my beard for the cause. I don't. That's a good reason to shave. Very cool. How you been, bud? You been good? Forest fires have calmed down in your world? Oh, my goodness. We can breathe again. It took a couple weeks to get the forest fire smoke out of the lungs, but now that that's gone and it's starting to get to single digits here overnight, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful out here. And back to some beautiful caribou weather, and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the the local bear that we have now uh, in our subdivision who kind of hangs out and says hello. Yeah, he's kind of cute. So, it, you know, everything's getting back to normal. For everyone who doesn't know uh, where you are, Dave, can you just reintroduce where you do your show from? Because we were just talking here on the shift of how we have so many places covered for these connections. Um, help everyone understand where you are in BC. I broadcast out of 100 Mile House, British Columbia, 
which is about two hours drive north of Kamloops and 45 minutes south of Williams Lake, British Columbia. Remember the old days when all this remote stuff was just, you couldn't do it without crazy technology and expensive dial-in connections and all that stuff? Oh, could you imagine back in those days? Absolutely. Feel sorry for the for Jim Robson back in the day having to do that for Canucks games. Holy cow. Him and Tom Larshide on NW there trying to, uh, you know, give a game over a phone line. And the phone line would crack out sometimes. Oh, man. I don't know how they did it. A, a satellite radio uh, broadcast truck that if they didn't level the truck properly and too many people got on one side of it, the satellite dish would turn a little bit and we would lose the signal oh my um, goodness so you know i mean it was a big satellite on top of the truck that doesn't seem so long ago anyway it's all changed so much some things haven't changed dave scott spaced out radio.com uh, the ufos should we get into the uh, politics of ufos or should we get into the um just some updates on the ufos well we can get into the pol- political side as as many people know my listeners and your listeners obviously because you're you're more political than i am in in the fact that we are in an election run here with the election being 13 days away and the big issue right now what we are hoping would be on the board especially coming out of the conservative party which didn't happen is the fact that we thought there somebody would take a chance on asking the ufo question during this election however due to COVID due to vaccinations, due to the political strife that is happening right now, and some may say an egotistical prime minister, some may not. We are in an election run that nobody wants, and you know what? It's too bad because I would love to see UFOs on the table. I would love to see one reporter have the stones to ask the UFO question. Because it is such a, an, an important question that American politicians are being hammered with almost on a daily basis. And yet up here we have no nobody who is asking any politicians whatsoever on where it's going. So, you know, I'd really hope that this would be the one, this would be the time where somebody would ask those questions and they're not doing it. You know, we want to talk about everything else. And all it takes is one question, one person to ask the question and a follow-up to get this entire ball rolling, and and nobody is asking it. And like I told you last time when we were on the air, we already know that Prime Minister Trudeau has been read in on U- the UFO program. We know that happened back in 2019. The official date, we don't know, but we know it happened. We, I personally have two sources that have confirmed that with me, one in Ottawa and one in Washington, D.C. And the fact that our prime minister has been read in, and more importantly, our television journalists, our radio journalists, who've talked about the UFO subject, but have not taken the opportunity, hint, hint, Shane, for you to do this next time you get a politician on, taken the opportunity to ask what they know about ufos now look your normal everyday mp isn't going to know anything they're not read in but the critic for the ministry of defense should be asking those questions harjeet sajin the minister of defense should be asking or answering those questions the prime minister himself should be answering those questions even if it's an answer that's so vague that says, look, that is, that is of uh, top national security, we're not going to answer that right now, at least it gets the subject some sort of momentum. It gets the ball rolling. And believe it or not, whether Canadians want to believe it or not, this is a major subject that we need to talk about. We need to know, are our skies safe? We know the Russians try to come in across the Arctic. That's why we got CF-18 Hornets up there. We know they come across the Pacific. We know that they come close into our airspace. What else is out there? And are we allowed to talk about this subject? That's another question that has come up from a number of people in Canadian ufology on whether or not the government is allowed to because through deals with NORAD, we may not be out to. Now, we could be speculating on that. Chances are we are speculating. But it is interesting, Shane, to try and figure out 
why we're not asking those questions and more so why are they not being addressed well let's role play for a second we're standing here we're in front of the prime minister dave scott you've got the microphone you have a question and you have a follow-up what would your question to the prime minister be if you were in that scrum and i'm assuming that everyone else has stopped throwing gravel and pebbles at this point all right so gravel and pebbles aside i would say mr prime minister we know that your former ambassador to the United States, David McNaughton, was read in on the UFO program by the head of the ATIP program. We also know that he then traveled to Ontario to meet with you and talk about this subject. Could you fill us in on that conversation? Okay, so then I'm assuming he uh, does what he always does. He tells us his answer is, get vaccinated. How do you follow up? Well, you would say, do aliens have to get vaccinated when they come down from the stars? Especially if they're in our airspace. <laughs> that's so good, Dave. I love it. Oh. No, but, uh, you yeah, know, you know what, we, it, uh-huh. hey, we, we can play fire with fire. We're allowed. If we get a sarcastic answer as a journalist, we can fire back a sarcastic question. We're allowed. And it's not out of the realm of the ordinary, right? It's not that it's unprofessional. We need to be able to do that. This is, Look, I know most Canadians will sit there and say, look, we have a lot more things to worry about than potential of UFOs. But we also have to remind ourselves that this is potentially the second biggest story in humankind's Uh, history next to jesus christ himself coming down from the heavens to say i'm back for a second time if you believe in that well it's a pretty popular story that's stood the test of time so i think that your assertion that it's a big story is uh, very valid well okay so it's i get it so it's it's your question is simple i i I get that so are we going to see it in the election no we're not and it's unfortunate and you know what i blame the conservative party for this Okay, it's not just Trudeau who's who's not answering the question. I do blame the Conservative Party for this because if you look over to uh, across the the pond, our fellow Commonwealthers from the United Kingdom actually had a two hour debate shortly after the United States released their preliminary report from the Department of National Intelligence. They had a two hour debate in the House of Lords about what is known about UFOs or UAP in British skies. Now, the defense minister refused to talk about it. She kept on denying the questions for two hours, but they pressed her, they hammered her, to the point where she got sick and tired of being repetitive. Now, why the Conservative Party, and I have told one of my sources in Ottawa that the Conservative Party dropped the ball on this for absolutely no reason. This is way before an election was called, And they had an opportunity to bring this up in the House of Commons, and they didn't. And that's another thing that the Conservative Party needs to answer the questions to as well. Why, as official opposition, when you had the opportunity to ask the question, did you not ask the UFO question? Because I can tell you right now, Shane, that there are members of the Conservative Party who listen to your show, number one. Number two, I know they listen to the segment I am on because I have been told. Okay, and that's how I got reached out to by somebody in Ottawa. Okay, I'm not going to say who, what, where, that's my source. And I know that it happened from this program and this segment that we do. And I can tell you point blank that the Conservative Party has people who are interested in this subject and they have... They dropped the ball in not asking in question period or bringing it up during the election because it is that important of a topic. Most Canadians may not think so, but when it affects not every, every uh, not also every Canadian, but every person on this planet, we have a right to know. And what are they hiding? Um, have you ever considered, I mean, I, I, it sounds tongue-in-cheek and playful, but I mean, why not? Have you ever considered doing a political party and just running for office to get somebody who would take on the ufo conversation in politics my friend no no i i don't want to go down that route because i like my life and you know i'm i'm way too much of a hybrid 
between a a conservative and a liberal. And I don't know if that would even work. And it would be very difficult for me to get my point across because, you know, first thing I would do is I'd fire Tom Rennie from Hockey Canada if I had that poll. That, that's my first move. UFOs would take secondary precedence over that. We would have to we would have to work on your platform because you can't run as the UFO party of Canada and fire the guy from from hockey first. We no. got to work on the priority of no the, no of the platform, but we can we can work on that. We can work on that. Okay, Dave Scott, spaceoutradio dot com. Before we go here, I want to hear some of the mistake in the Phoenix Lights story that you shared. With me. Sure. Okay, so this past weekend at the International UFO Conference down in Phoenix, Arizona, one of the speakers at the event was Fife Symington. Now, you may not recognize the name, but he is the former governor of the state. Okay, Symington, who uh, was allegedly involved in some other shady business practices, was the man in charge of the state during March 13, 1997, when the Phoenix lights occurred. Over 65,000 people in Phoenix witnessed the Phoenix lights that night, where there was like this boomerang shape of lights... That, you know, some people who don't believe in this say, oh, that was debunked. No, it's never been debunked on what it is. The official report said it was uh, A-10 Thunderbolts that were flying over Phoenix dropping flares. The problem is the lights didn't go out. Flares go out. And eventually, when that happened, the next day, there was national press, state press, press from all other states around attending a press conference to try and figure out what happened. What was that in the skies over Phoenix? Because the people say from Mesa to Tucson to Phoenix that there was two major craft in the air, one giant one that looked to be spread out a couple miles and one that was smaller in a boomerang shape. Symington made a fool out of his citizens and set, comes out in the press conference in front of all the cameras saying, we got our man, our state troopers got it, we figured out the Phoenix Lights and what happened last night, and then the doors to the conference room open up, and two sheriff officers walk out somebody in an extraterrestrial conference room who comes out, go, this fake alien comes to the sto- to the microphone and says, I'm sorry. Now, the entire media starts laughing, but for decades since that event, Symington has taken a plethora of heat over this that he basically insulted every one of his citizens who were concerned about what they were seeing in the sky. Now, or pardon me, a few years later, he comes out and states that he actually was an eyewitness to what was happening. And now he's apologizing once again to his constituents and the people of Arizona that he did not take the UFO phenomena seriously and did the wrong thing by embarrassing his state and his constituents. Interesting. It's so convenient to just, oops, by the way, does that drive you crazy? Well, I mean, here's the thing. Now, I never saw the conference. I just saw that he was speaking there. My news guy, John Hudson, who does all my UFO reports, he he actually picked up this story. But I want to know a couple of things. I want to know, did the government or some alphabet agency or the military put you up to saying nothing, to making a mockery of this, to to sloughing it off like it didn't happen? Those are the questions we need to know. It's not about the event now. The event happened 24 years ago. What it is about now is finding out, was there a cover-up? Were you told to shut your mouth as governor of Arizona? And that is the big question that needs to be asked after all these years. Well, that is a very big question, and we will continue to ask it here on The Shift with Dave Scott and SpacedOutRadio.com. David, so great to hear your voice. Um... Uh, I look forward to following up and learning more very soon, brother. All right, my friend, you take care. Thank you so much for you and your awesome listeners for tuning us in, and thank you for joining us on Spaced Out Radio as well. Take care, Shane. Shane Hewitt, everybody, from The Shift out of Vancouver, right across Canada.
the news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR News Wire at the back end of every show. And Captain Shirk has us right set up. How about this? Italian stunt pilot has created a new Guinness World Record when he flew his custom-modified Red Bull plane 1.4 miles through a pair of tunnels in Turkey. Dario Costa took his modified Zidco Edge 540 race plane for a 1.4-mile flight through the twin Catalaca tunnels along the northern Maramara Highway in Turkey, setting the Guinness World Record for the longest tunnel flown through with an airplane. Costa said it took about a year of practice to prepare for the 43.44 second flight. I'd never flown in a tunnel in my life. Nobody had ever done it. So there was a big question mark in my head whether everything would go as expected. Well, because it's Red Bull, because they love to push the limits, you know it worked. And it, he says that it was a big relief, of course, but big, big happiness was the main emotion. For me, he says, it's a dream come true. Moving on here, here's a good one. Real classy story here. A 14-year-old aspiring engineer in New Jersey used a 3D printer to create a prosthetic hand for his friend who is missing multiple fingers on one hand. Sammy Salvano, kid who's going somewhere, said he spent most of his summer designing and 3D printing the prosthetic hand for his, his best friend, Ewan. Kirby said Salvano's invention allowed him to pick up his mother's car keys for the first time. The homemade device offered at a low-cost alternative to commercial prosthetics, which could cost between $3,000 and $30,000, Sheridan Silvano, got to be proud of her son, obviously, said the boy has had an inventive streak for his entire life. Silvano, who is entering the 8th grade, says he hopes to attend Drexel University and pursue a career in engineering. How good is that for that young lad? Good for him. We need more kids like that. Thought of the day happens every night at this time Where we ask a question, then you say the answers What makes you happy in today's Thought of the day? Drew, my three children Science Bob, my 17 grandkids Danny, dirt bike riding and drag racing Magnus, metal music, tacos and my cat Drew, pancakes for dinner That wouldn't make me happy Cindy, a, a man who loves me unconditionally. Oh, and Bigfoot. Bruce, what makes me happy? A high five from Dave Scott. Oh, yes, Brucey Bruce. Oh, yes. Nicole, high strangeness and researching high strangeness. Maribeth, cutting trails in our little piece of Pope County, the best kept secret in southern Illinois. Alan, being on the grass side of Earth. Andrew, high strangeness cooking. Chuck, my wife, my four-legged kids, E.T., hockey, and NASCAR. They have about the same amount of teeth. Paula, helping others and seeing them ma happy makes me happy. Doug, mustard biscuits. Jeannie, crunchy tacos makes her happy. And the final one tonight, Jason gets it. Back to school time for children. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Day. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the SOR Newswire. And, of course, to Shane Hewitt from The Shift in Vancouver. And our guest tonight, Geraldine Orozco. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone tuning us in on YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and of course on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. 
Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.